Hi folks, this is Judy, Sean, and we've got Blake here. We're here a little early, we realize, but we decided since we saw some of you guys in the waiting room, we decided to start it up a little early. We have a slideshow that you can look, read a little bit, and then we're gonna do some polling questions a little bit early. So um, I think, as you see right now, you don't see our, oh, that's because I'm not showing you my screen, I don't believe you. Let's see, show my screen. So now you just see our faces. You guys better entertain them for the moment. <laughs> Get on. Happy Friday to everyone, happy Friday. Yeah. Hopefully everyone's staying safe out there. I know continuing issues with supply chain and PPE for the healthcare setting. Um, I know we're struggling with that in our area and imagine seems like that's a pretty common issue across the country. So over a lot of interesting custom jobs, uh, PPE hacks, which I think Judy has some uh, images or pictures or videos of that uh, we'll be showing with you shortly. So yeah, I think they, they are up now. So our, our show today is with Sean Kaufman. Wave, Sean. There that we go. Was Sean. Big. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> so we're excited to have him present again for us today. Sean is a human behavior specialist. We're probably a good group to have that. Oh, boy. I just like watching behavior. That's all. It's like uh, the airports are, and right now, actually, the slideshow you're about ready to show, this is this will be good human behavior, we'll see. Oh, yeah? Very good. We'll see. <clears throat> well, it is supposed to automatically cycle for me, so it doesn't seem to be doing that. So evidently, I get to. So we at the Association for Vascular Access really thank each of you, especially the ones working at the bedside and those that support our bedside healthcare clinicians. Your dedication and professionalism are more than appreciated. Um, we, on behalf of Ava, we thank and admire you and appreciate everything you're doing. Stay, definitely stay safe. Our upcoming webinars, um, on April 16th, oh, that went fast. It'll cycle back through. Many of these pictures I grabbed from the internet and um, just seeing all the, some of the struggles happening in pre-hospitalization and in hospitalization going on. So our, our warriors. I'm guessing this is from Asia based on the writing, but reusing gowns is something we never thought we'd do or see. <laughs> this is a study I believe they did at University of Chicago and they're looking at the the difference between intubating or BiPAP early this I'd like to show you this is something um, I got from Sean Lau at Stanford or at uh, president of Haven so this is what they're doing to protect their ultrasound machine by using a wrap a poly wrap and then I went on um, Amazon to just see different things to see if they're available and now they're only for hospitalized uh, or hospital systems. Some of the hacks that we have been talking about from hockey to uh, helpers. <laughs> this is my hack. I, um, I'm an avid snorkeler. So I put a sterile wrap over the intake of it. <laughs> I don't believe in any other time where in a trash bag at work would have been okay. But we're in a different uh, time in our lives. Kind of like this one. You could wear a baseball hat at work. Don't know how well it works, but uh, kind of cute for golf as well, maybe. Got this one off of Facebook on a post too. It's uh, well known to us as Dr. Chopra, and what there, what's happening at his hospital system, and our dire need for N95s across the nation. Is that those uh, hanging up to dry? 
<laughs> you know, I don't know. Honestly, I stole many of these off of Facebook. So um, we are going to give it just a few more minutes, and then we're going to go into some polling, some polling questions for you guys. So Sean, Blake, what have you seen out there? Go ahead, Blake. Oh, I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit about my experience. Uh, so I work in quality assurance now. This is part of like hospital administration, working with our vascular access team um, and being redeployed to a clinical area. So uh, right now, actually operating COVID screening tents outside of the hospital, um, kind of like a drive-through assembly where uh, living in Maine, very rural, um, <clears throat> we don't have a lot of confirmed cases. A little bit farther south in the Portland areas where uh, the largest density of cases are coming back as positive, also one of our larger cities in the state. And uh, it's just interesting in like the rural sector, um, working in our state capital, even um, with the drive-through piece, you know, being in PPE, having people pull up and being able to really screen all the patients that come into the hospital, um, Certainly hospital volumes are down uh, just because we're trying to eliminate any unnecessary traffic through the facility. Uh, like a lot of institutions across the country, uh, instituting a zero visitor policy, things like that in order to, again, keep our patients safe, keep our communities safe. Um, really important things that we're doing in our time right now. Um, but, you know, just driving through, you know, sick or not sick, uh, in our PPE outside, uh, Maine's a little bit cold, just like a lot of the other northern states this time of year. Uh, we've been blessed with some uh, atypically warm weather, um, so that's helpful. So a lot of rain and snow. Um, but yeah, assessing people in the car, having them register in the car, and then screening them in the tent outside of the facilities um, has been helpful and kind of like really, uh, again, keep keeping those hospital populations safe uh, from the public, you know, immunocompromised, hospitalized patients. Um, and, you know, with the tiering system for how we're screening nowadays, it doesn't seem like we're doing a whole lot of testing unless you're in healthcare or if you're have a, or if you're critically ill uh, or in that immunocompromised kind of category. Um, so, you know, again, more about public education, uh, stay at home, uh, getting people work notes that they need in order to be uh, safely at home while they're self-quarantining. Um, helping people with uh, other forms of uh, physician assessment, uh, prescriptions, things like that. So um, a great resource in our rural area. So, you know, I'm interested in, you know, some of the more urban populations and how they're dealing with these crises as well. Thanks, Sean. Well, I think we're going to do a couple of polls here. We have quite a few people online. So those of you on your computer or on your phone that can participate, first of all, we want to know how are you doing? Get to select one. And we're going to go through quite a few of the, these just to get some engagement to start up with. <clears throat> and we're going to share those results. So most people are doing good, better than 50%. Some of you guys are above the curve at the 27% of excellent. And um, sorry about the folks doing poor. But, um, okay, let's do another one. How much fear do you have specific to this threat? You could rate that. You guys are doing great with the participation. Appreciate that. We'll close that one and share. Moderate and high. That's uh, 70, 82%. 82%, or, yeah. 82 yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Sean, how many more of these do you want us to do before we it's get into your go, You go ahead. I'm, 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 I love learning a lot about the audience, about the folks that are out there and what they're thinking and feeling. So absolutely. Keep Keep going. Okay. If, they're, if they're participating, that's good news. It means they're engaging. So Agreed. Uh, the more I know about them, that's the better I can do on my end. So keep going. Perfect. And we want you guys to know that at, during the presentation today, 
if there's any questions that you have, we want to make sure that you post them in the type of question here box because Sean is going to spend as much time as he needs, we need to answer as many questions as he can. Additionally, in the um, handout section, you can grab a couple of documents. The presentation is in there as well as um, there's a CE or a QR code. And also a bunch of you asked questions on Facebook when I posed a question. Those questions are in there with Sean's answers. So um, please feel free to go grab those out of the handout section. And as you as you guys are you know filling these polls out and and looking at those questions as well, um, just keep this in mind that that I am not a medical professional. I'm not uh, as as uh, heroic as we are seeing our nurses and doctors. I'm a, more of a behavioral psychologist, a behaviorist around infectious disease. So some were very technical questions on uh, medical procedures. And uh, so I clearly noted in those answers that uh, I am not a medical professional and so will not be able to answer that particular question. So, uh, but I, there was a lot that I could answer. So, um, perfect. Wow. So we have 9%. Yeah. And actually 31% are either yes or unsure. Um, lots of no's. Lots of no's. And wow. as the data would suggest, we're seeing, I mean, CDC just released a number that said about 25% are asymptomatic. Uh, I believe uh, more out of what's coming out of South Korea, it's more out of one out of five. So about a 20% 20, 20 asymptomatic case um, in North or in South Korea. And I'll tell you why why that data I think is so important to, to know. Very good. Can't wait to hear it. How would you rate your leadership's response to COVID-19? This will be very good. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the answer here. I am too. You guys are doing great with the participation. It makes it much more fun. Okay. Well, and it allows for us to serve them better too. By getting information from you guys, I tell you what, it, it really does help frame the talk. So very good. Great. You guys have some good leaders out there. About Absolutely. 70 or 68%. Yeah. And some bad ones. <laughs> some very <laughs> bad ones. Oh, goodness. It would always be great to talk about, you know, let's define what leadership is. And so that's, I think that's great. That's very good. Agreed. We're going to launch another poll about how your friends and coworkers, you feel like they're doing. I know as healthcare professionals, we often get questions about what do we do? It's like, duck and hide. <laughs> okay, we're gonna close this one, share some results again. At least it's trying to. Oh. I'm trying to. It went away. So, um, how are you? They're doing about 53% are saying good. Sorry about that. Had a little glitch on this. We um, had over we had over 40% say fair and below too. So there's a lot of people I think that it's scary. Struggling. What science seems to say is that we have a blend between both of those. How are you and how are your 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 friends doing? Uh, somewhere in the middle is the the reality of the situation. Now this is about you personally, guys. Are you wearing nose, mouth, and eye cover when in public places? And doesn't necessarily mean a mask, but something. Okay, we're getting better participation each time. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Okay, 66% today are saying no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, some people don't have anything to do it with. Okay. I may be able to give them some hacks on that one. I know, I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> this is a real quick one. Are you currently working or exposed to COVID-19 positive patients that you know of? There you go, I think that's a, that's a very good that you know of. We 
We just have a couple more after this, guys, but I appreciate you guys playing with us. Very good. Oh, uh, almost a split. Very good. That's very powerful. Okay, and now, ooh, this is a select all. So what PPE is available to you if you have a rule out patient? Not confirmed, a, a rule out. Do you, do you think everybody understands on the phone what rule out patients would be? Why don't you help us just in case? <laughs> should, oh gosh, I made that wrong. It should be what you, I created that so you could only select one. So sorry about yeah. that folks, but yeah. nonetheless. Yeah, because yeah, it's only yeah, select mm -hmm. one. So this is when you're, when you're trying to determine how you're triaging your patients, if I'm reading this right, is that right, Judy? Well, when you have a patient, yes, the patient's in, in-house. Yeah. And the test is being taken, but yet you don't, it's not resulted yet. Well, yeah. well I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I'd love to see, I'd love to hear uh, a test. If we had more polls, it would be interesting to know because we're hearing that majority of people, uh, even if they are symptomatic are not being tested. Um, so maybe I'll, in yeah. Georgia. Um, I will put one in there for later on, Sean, as you're doing your presentation. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like the sickest of the sickest are getting tested, but those that meet the clinical definition are are simply being told, you know, return return home, and if you have difficulty breathing, you know, <laughs> so right. If you don't require O's, then yeah, go home. Yeah. Okay, so you have confirmed patients. What do you get to wear in your facility? This is going to be interesting because uh, it's more along the lines of what will be available. That is true. Okay. Okay, we're starting to lose participation. So we've got one more after this and we're going to get right into the good stuff. Yeah, people are tired. They're like, it's Friday. I was like, what? I'm being a, I've got a test? It's going to be five o'clock somewhere soon. <laughs> okay. This is it. And if I could get uh, good participation, I appreciate it. We'll get right to Sean. So what's your biggest concern? Is it your health, your family's health, economy, being isolated, or just the worry about our personal freedoms? I think we should package this one up and send it, uh, send it out. We'll see what the answer is here. <laughs> Very good. Well, we have 80% that have voted. So I'm going to close this one up. Beautiful. And share these. Very good. Our health. Very good. Well, thank you, everybody, for doing this. Um, Blake, if you want to take it away and maybe abbreviate our intro since we've been here for a little bit, <laughs> and then we'll get this moving. And I'm going to give you the, all the controls there, Sean. Awesome. Well, I'll, uh, let me just jump on here, and read the, the intro. So, hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Applying Logic to Evidence uh, for Healthcare and Beyond. Um, Blake Hotchkiss in the ABA Education Department, joined by Judy Thompson, uh, Director of Education at the Association for Vascular Access. As a reminder, uh, this is a CE event and you will receive an email uh, within two hours of the end of the program today. Um, you're welcome to peruse and download documents in the handout section uh, of the webinar. There is a QR code if you want to jump in there and do the survey before that email comes out. Um, the PDF of today's pre presentation uh, and a list of questions with answers that were submitted via the Facebook post. Uh, at the end of the presentation, Sean told us uh, that he is happy to stay on and answer all of your questions. You send us in by using the ask a question area in the application. We're continuing to add all kinds of new content, uh, webinars uh, for the coming weeks and months. Uh, so keep on the lookout, uh, like uh, Judy was uh, leading in with the slides there. Uh, Thursday, April 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We've got device selection in the ICU brought to you uh, by Teleflex Medical. Uh, Tuesday, April 21st at 2 p.m. Uh, again, Eastern Standard, for better or for worse, uh, harm reduction ethics and patients who use substances with vascular access infusion therapy challenges. Thursday, May 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, catheter technology 
uh, an evidence-based risk reduction uh, brought to us by, <clears throat> again, Teleflex Medical. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today, Sean Kaufman. Uh, for over 25 years, Sean has worked to minimize human risk factors within workplace environments by controlling uh, for the interactions between human behavior and environmental conditions. Before leading his own organization, Sean has served as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and uh, Emory University Rollins School for Public Health. Uh, during his tenure at both organizations, Sean responded to several emergency situations, including 9-11, the anthrax attacks, Ebola, H1N1, and SARS, uh, for which he was awarded two Health and Human uh, Distinguished Service Awards. Sean is a behavioral expert who understands the risk of human behavior. Uh, he has served many organizations and assisted in controlling apathy, complacency, perceived mastery, and unconscious incompetence. All noted human risk factors, regardless of where you are in the world and what industry you serve. So, Sean, with that, I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you very, very much for uh, for that wonderful introduction. I want to thank AVA and I want to thank all of you out there uh, for having me again. It's given me kind of a second chance. I know that there was uh, we had to do a very, very quick presentation uh, last week, and so again. It's a wonderful opportunity to join and, and be a part of this great event. I do want to also say thank you. Uh, a great amount of thanks to the healthcare workers, uh, the, uh, the public health professionals, the laboratory scientists, uh, a, a great number of people out there who are facing the infectious disease threat and the, uh, you know, the, the threat really on the front lines uh, battling it out as we're learning more and trying to adapt strategies and becoming better at this fight. I also, though, think it's important at this time to begin recognizing those that are struggling uh, as well uh, at home, uh, individuals who may be fighting addiction uh, uh, that are relapsing, uh, individuals who are trying to survive with their children uh, running around the houses, uh, husbands and wives, partners who are living with one another and are starting to get a little edgy. Uh, so I do want to put a smile on people's face. It is Friday, uh, th though in Georgia, where I'm at, we're not going to have many places to run. Uh, I do want to start off with something pretty uh, symbolic here. I want you to take a look at this slide, and I want you to uh, think about what you see. Um, if you were to be asked to write kind of an essay on what it is you see here on this piece of paper, uh, many of you would... Uh, would write about the fact that you see a black dot in the middle of uh, of the screen. Your uh, webcam keeps coming on and on, just, just letting you know. Um, so you would see a black dot in the middle of the screen. And uh, this it's a funny story, but a professor did this uh, once. And the neat part is, is that sometimes in life, we become so focused on that black dot that it begins to consume uh, everything that we see. And uh, with this SARS coronavirus 2 or COVID-19 threat, uh, we are almost in essence consumed with that. That's all we're seeing. But I wanna invite you this weekend or when you do have a moment of time to actually step out of that black dot and focus on the white that you see on the screen, all the blessings and the good things that you have in this, in this life and the things that we tend to forget about when we are solely focused on that black dot. So I'm going to encourage you to do that, to take a gratitude walk, to get outside and, and during your walk, think about all the good things, all the things you're grateful for, all the blessings that you have, uh, and to get out of that black dot, to not necessarily focus, to turn it off, because I think that's a healthy thing. Every single one of you that we are speaking to today, uh, you're needed for a marathon. Uh, this is not just going to abruptly stop like a light switch. It's going to continue and it's going to be around for quite some time. And so we need you to pace yourself. We need you to step out of that black dot, to remember the white space, to have the belief that we will get through this and we can get through this together. Uh, time is on our side. We as human beings will adapt and we will survive uh, uh, as we have in the past. We'll get better. And, uh, and so give it some time. In the meanwhile, while you're in the trenches, 
uh, do your best to take care of yourselves, to set healthy boundaries, and again, stop focusing just on that black dot and look at all of the white on that page, meaning look at all of the things that you have, not just the things you're going through today. Uh, disclosure, I am the CEO and founding partner of Safer Behaviors. One of the things that I love about my own business is that I get to share with you my truth. And what do I mean by that? I have a lot of experience and a lot of, uh, of beliefs about infectious disease. Sometimes when you work with organizations like CDC and Emory uh, and other organizations, you're filtered. You can't say what you think, you, you, you fear uh, uh, reprisal or disagreement. Um, I'm in a great position where I get to share with you uh, my, my truthful uh, feelings about what's happening and what I see and what I believe based on my experiences. A big question, I wanted to go through uh, some common questions that I get before I jump into the main content of the talk. A lot of people will ask, Sean, how do you think this will end? I really truly see three outcomes here. Uh, the first is uh, very unlikely, uh, like SARS-1, which is kind of it, it started, uh, it was around until about uh, the July time period. It started about, roughly about the same time uh, and then it ended around the July period and it kind of just fizzled out and went away. And it went away, uh, it's neat, because I had my second son who uh, uh, was born during the time I was responding with, uh, to LAX and, and working on SARS-1 with CDC. But uh, he's now uh, 15 years old. So, you know, it was about 15 years ago. Uh, very unlikely that because of the, uh, the, the way that this is spread around the world, it's very unlikely that we're going to see a fizzle out like SARS-1. Uh, more likely, we're going to see something like influenza, where we'll see a transition into the southern hemispheres uh, and then a return to the northern hemispheres uh, sometime around October, November. That is probable. And the reality, again, is it's not hopeless, ladies and gentlemen. We're, we have time. And when we have time, we can get better at what it is that we're doing. And I'll explain a little bit as to why this has gotten so bad in, in, in the future slides. Um, we also have a theory that this could be endemic, very similar to what we would see with chickenpox, where we're simply going to wait, uh, live with it, and wait until uh, we have a vaccine or some type of therapeutic drug, uh, and we'll deal with it that way as well. So there are theories out there. So uh, again, I think uh, we're going to have to understand that this is a new norm. Now, things are going to have to change. Uh, I really, truly believe that things must change. Uh, we cannot sit in isolation. We will have social collapse if we do. We're going to have to get aggressive and offensive uh, against this, uh, this bug. And right now, we're just not ready to. And, and I'll explain why um, here. But uh, um, how many can we expect to become ill or die? This is very hard for me to, to, to say as well. Uh, President Trump came out and said between 100 and 200,000 Americans. Uh, I tend to disagree with that uh, statement. Um, I used to be under the impression that maybe it'll be lower, uh, but in taking a look at numbers and, and playing with mathematical models, there is just some common sense math you take a look at. You take a look at how many people are in the United States, these numbers are, are a bit higher than, than, than I would anticipate because if you take the total population in the United States, you multiply it by 70%. And when you multiply that by 70%, you're gonna get roughly about 224 million people because 30% of the US by last census are kind of living in uh, uh, suburban areas. They're not so close. They're not living around tight cities. So if you take that and you say, well, okay, 224 million Americans live around tight cities where we're going to see this spike. And then if you say, okay, well, if we've got 224 million, let's imagine that only 50% of those people get infected. You can vary the numbers. I'm going high here. Let's say 50%. Now you're looking at 112 million. Now, all the data that we have today, all the data we have today are on cases we know about. Now, some experts estimate that for every one case we know about, there could be 10 out there that we don't. Some say five, some say seven. There's a, it's a wide range. But let's just say that for every one we know about, we don't know about one. So I'm just gonna cut 112 million down in half uh, by saying we only know about 50%. That brings it down to 56 million people. If you look at a 1% death rate or a 0.6% death rate, depending on what, we, what you read, these are the numbers, 
you're really looking at three, four, five hundred thousand Americans uh, uh, passing away as a result of this uh, potential threat. Again, with time being on our side, we're going to get better as time goes on. So I'm a little bit less optimistic about a 100 to 200,000 uh, death ratio. I really am. Uh, I think that it may be a bit more, uh, especially when you start looking at some uh, some numbers, some common sense numbers. Now, a lot of people are also asking, you know, Sean, why is this so bad? Well, uh, again, first and foremost, we have a novel virus. This is uh, something that's new to our population. I'm not telling anybody anything new here. But one thing that we have not studied, and it's clear, it's very, very clear that there's some miscommunication between what aerosolization is and what macro and micro droplets are. This bug, this, this agent that we're dealing with, it has spike proteins. That's what those little red things are. And forgive me, I'm colorblind. But on this image, you see the red or burgundy. I don't know what color it is. It could be green. I'm red and green colorblind. But the point is this. Those are spike proteins. And those spike proteins love ACE2 receptors. That's what they do. Now, what are ACE2 receptors? Well, they're on mucous membranes, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. And the reality is, is that when people talk, there's two types of droplets that come out of people's mouths. There's macro, which are big. They come out and they contaminate surfaces. And then there's micro, these little droplets that kind of float in the air. Now, when they float in the air, the question is, can these spike proteins, remnants in these micro droplets, hit your mucous membranes and cause a, a, an exchange between virus and your human cells? The answer truly is unknown, but based on what we're seeing with the number of people being infected, with the reports from science, we are suspecting that these micro droplets are hitting your, your, your actual portals of entry and causing an exchange between the virus and your cells, meaning your, the spike proteins are hitting the ACE2 receptors and the exchange between virus and human cells begins to occur. These micro macro droplets are why I believe, and again, I've, I'm fairly accurate with some of the predictions we make, I believe that every single person is going to be asked to start covering their eyes, nose, and mouth when they go in public. It won't be asking you to do it with a mask. It'll just simply say it's important for you to protect your eyes, nose, and mouth for yourself, your safety, protecting your portals of entry, but it's also going to be important for those asymptomatic individuals because if they're protecting their eyes, nose, and mouth as well, when they cough or talk, they're not going to be contaminating surfaces outside of themselves. So we've seen this in South Korea. We've seen this in China. We're seeing it in Italy. People are going to be asked, I believe, very soon when they go out of their homes to be protecting their eyes, nose, and mouth. I think that's going to be something that's going to be recommended here shortly if it isn't already. Now, one other thing about why it's so bad is, ladies and gentlemen, we are missing a pandemic response team member. And quite honestly, we have not prepared people who are serving on the front lines. Look, we can throw personal protective equipment at healthcare workers and people who work on the front lines of emerging infectious diseases but unless they know how to take that gear off, wear it, and use it properly, they're putting themselves at risk. And I have plenty of examples to show, and that scares me, meaning I think the healthcare workers today need a bit more training. But the one missing ingredient here, ladies and gentlemen, is that testing. We've been blown away. You cannot stay ahead of a pandemic threat if you can't give anyone and everyone a test and get the results back very quickly. Now, let me give you an example. In South Korea, if you want a test, you can get a test. You can pay for it, or they will give it to you if you're a patient that they suspect is sick. Now, that test is usually processed and delivered with results within six hours, 24 hours at worst. Right now, we're hearing five to 10 business days in some cases, and only the sickest of the sickest are being tested. Ladies and gentlemen, you can't stay in front of a pandemic or an epidemic with those types of tests. We are missing a pandemic response team member. And until we start getting those tests and that information back quickly, we can't do contract or contact tracing and we can't make sure we stay ahead of this with aggressive isolation countermeasures. We're, we're gonna simply be asking everybody to shelter in place, which is a scary recommendation because this virus affects certain people more than others. And we should be protecting those people um, and rather than saying everybody's going to fend for themselves, and now those individuals are forced to leave their homes to take care of themselves. Now, last but not least, 
there's a lot of misinterpretation of data. I, I have been blown away. People talking about death rate numbers, people talking about reproductive numbers. Listen, there is so much we don't know about this virus. And a lot of people are pretending like we know a lot about it. And the reality is we truly don't know the total number of cases we have in a community. If we don't know the total number of cases we have in the community, we cannot possibly calculate an accurate death rate. We don't know a proper reproductive number. We can only assume based on bubble populations. So the reality is there's a lot we don't know. And if you're getting your information from the press and the news, I beg you, turn it off. These are not credible sources. They misrepresent information. Just a classic example. The, the other day, 17 days, this was what the press was reporting. They found that the, that the virus, the RNA of the virus can be found 17 days the press ran with that and as if 17 days is a viable virus in an environment. That couldn't have been more ridiculous. And it was a, a very dangerous report. I had more hospital cleaning staff contact me that day saying, Sean, what, what, what does this mean? And all it meant was that there's a footprint of the virus. It doesn't mean that it's a viral, it's not viable. It's a footprint. It means it's been there. It doesn't mean that it can actually enter a live human cell and cause disease. And so sometimes there's these misrepresentations of, of data and of information that cause hysteria and panic in people. And, and you can't just say, oh, well, we're sorry. We're sorry we did that. It causes a lot of complications and a lot of issues. Now, some interesting facts about this virus is that if we're looking at the worst case pandemic influenza, the reproductive knot or the R, R knot or the reproductive number, the number of people for every one person who gets sick, the number of people they transmitted to was 1.8. This is sitting at the highest level of, of pandemic influenza. This one's sitting at 2.5. We know that it's spreading from person to person, which is why I believe the strategy of sheltering in place and stay, I mean, today in Georgia, as an example, at 6 p.m., we are now going from a shelter in place to a stay at home unless you have to go to the grocery store or you have to go to a, a, a doctor's meeting. You're supposed to be staying at home. We know that CDC just recently reported a 25% asymptomatic rate with this disease. Now, one thing that I, I again, I'm, I get very challenged with data. South Korea, I love the data coming out of South Korea, and let me tell you why. If you want to get tested, you can get tested. It doesn't even matter if you have symptoms or not. If you want it, you get it. Uh, you may have to pay for it, but you get it. South Korea has found when they started testing everyone, over 300,000 tests, that roughly one in five individuals who got a test were asymptomatic and they were positive. So we know that there are some people out there that are asymptomatic and positive, but please don't panic because of that. This is not atypical. Uh, especially with coronaviruses and, and even with influenza. When someone is asymptomatic, we're also finding out that they are shedding less virus. when they're They may be able to shed the virus, but they're not shedding it as though they're someone who's symptomatic, which is a lot of virus, okay? They're shedding a lot of virus. So what we're seeing is asymptomatic individuals are not shedding large quantities of virus. They also shed within very tight periods of time and in addition, please hear what I'm saying. There is not an asymptomatic strain of this virus, which means that if you have someone at home who's asymptomatic and they cause illness to other people in their family, those individuals in the family are going to present in a different way. They may become symptomatic. And the reality is, is that you'll be able to do, if you do constant case contract, contacting, you'll be able to chase where this goes even if you don't have symptoms in some people, okay? And last but not least, please know, this virus is lipid envelope, which means you should be decontaminating surfaces around those you think or are positive for SARS coronavirus 2. Wipe down those surfaces. I don't care if you have just soap and water. Look, lipid envelope viruses are the most fragile uh, viruses out there. All you have to do is interrupt that protein envelope. And in interrupting that protein envelope, you will make sure it does not enter a live human cell. Now, another question is, does this virus treat everyone equally and fairly? And the answer is no. Well, it's yes and no. It treats everyone equally. And what I mean by that is it loves us. This virus loves us as a host. Okay, however, 
However, even though it loves us equally, it does not treat us fairly. Meaning, if you are, are uh, of uh, older age, 60 and above, have existing medical conditions, it's going to pick on you. It's going to be bully. Now, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you have to understand that I am a father of three. I am a husband of a beautiful Italian wife who states her opinions frequently. I have four, I have two, her, her mom and dad uh, are alive. My parents are alive. I love them dearly. I do not hear my words and think that I do not have a heart. Do not hear my words and think that I don't think about my children. But listen to me, science is science. And even though we may have outliers with this disease, young people that seem to not have conditions and die, some people that die and we don't understand why. So we're talking about now hundreds of thousands of cases that point to this very clearly. This disease loves you if you're over 60, if you have pre-existing medical conditions, it truly picks on you. It's a bully for that population. And if we don't start listening to that science and start behaving offensively and aggressively, meaning there's gonna come a day, ladies and gentlemen, where we're gonna have to come out of hiding. It's just, that is just a fact. We cannot stay at home and hide from this thing until it goes away. And you will be asked sooner or later to do that. And when you are, get ready, because again, remember what the science says. There will always be outliers. And I'm not being cold when I say that, but I think at this point, you have to blend your approach. You have to say to people over the age of 60, those with diabetes, heart disease, respiratory disease, you have to say to those people, it's time for us to take care of you. Stay home, your VIPs, your vulnerable, important people. Stay home. We will bear the burden of this disease for you. Stay home, let us take care of you. Because again, if you shut down society for everyone, everyone, I'm telling you right now, the society cannot maintain and sustain. And so that's the risk that we're facing today. We have a real, real threat. We have a real threat with this COVID-19, SARS coronavirus 2, it is true. But we also have this boogeyman threat. We have this shadow that is standing over us and literally scaring people. And, and the news, I tell you, it's like, a, it's, like, it's like a cake mix. You put batter and egg and you form this beautiful cake. I'm telling you, telling people to go home, giving them nothing to do, having them sit around their kids, everyone, and then watch more news. I'm telling you right now, what you've done is you've taken that boogeyman that shadow, and you've literally made that bigger than the threat itself. And that is true from a scientific standpoint. You've made that boogeyman and that shadow much bigger than the threat itself. And we've seen this before, ladies and gentlemen, at least I have. I saw this in postal employees who were exposed to anthrax. If you were alive and around during the anthrax attacks in 2001, there were 22 Americans that got sick. There were five deaths and the whole country practically shut down for any white powder substance that was found, including white powder found under donut racks. I saw this during SARS virus, coronavirus one, the, the first generation where people walked around with bras on their face and were taking Tylenol AM and PM to avoid infection. We saw it with the hysteria of H1N1, where people go to the doctors, no, you're having anxiety type from watching too much TV. And we saw it with Ebola. Ebola, we saw it even here in, in, with Ebola. I mean, infectious disease causes panic. It causes great fear. And what I'm trying to get at here is, is that my job as a behaviorist is, we don't have a problem when the scientific quantification of risk matches what the public sees. We don't have a problem. Unfortunately, in public health, that rarely happens. Many of you being uh, uh, providers out there know that somebody, for example, with diabetes will say, yeah, it's, you know, millions of people have diabetes. Yeah, you know, it's not a big deal. Science defining the risk here, perceptions down here. Influenza every year, 50,000 Americans die. Science defines the risk of influenza here. The public perception is here. Very rarely do we get this, this blend of, okay, we're, we're right on mark here. But what we're seeing now is that public perception of this risk is extremely high. It's very high. And the scientific definition is below it. And that's what we're seeing right now. So we see a lot of outrage, not complacency. See, complacency is on the left there uh, where your science defines the risk to be higher than the way the public perceives it. 
See, when you see that, what you, what's going on is an individual has a, a set of comfort, even, even though the risk may be real, they're very comfortable with it. They have an increased ability to think and rationalize risk because they're calm. Ah, it's just diabetes. Well, you're underbehaving. You're, you're, you're apathetic. You're becoming complacent. Yeah, but I'm still sound of mind because I'm not panicking. I'm not experiencing outrage. But when it's the other way, when someone perceives the risk to be far greater than science, all of a sudden they begin overbehaving. They buy toilet paper and lots of it. They begin taking masks away from healthcare providers. They begin practicing and be in, in ways of hoarding resources. Again, not uncommon. We saw it during anthrax with antibiotics. We saw, we saw it, we've seen it many times. They begin doing things to take care of themselves because they fear something that is far greater than what science quantifies the overall risk to be. Now, I'm an oldie but goodie when it comes to psychology. I believe a lot of the greatest psychology was done early, early on because, well, quite honestly, there were no rules to protect people. And I know it's horrible to say, but I'm just being honest here. They got real results from real people. Now, Abraham Maslow didn't write hierarchy of needs so that somebody could come and study psychology and go, oh, really? You go through life and you do it. That's not what Abraham Maslow was trying to do during this hierarchy of needs. What Abraham Maslow was saying is that, look, at any time in your life, you may have basic needs challenged. You have basic needs as a human being. Now, one of the reasons why infectious disease will always be a ticking time bomb, always, is because every single basic need of a human being is gonna be challenged by infectious disease. For example, the physiological needs, air, food, water, and shelter. Biological agents or infectious diseases can contaminate each and every one of those. It also challenges our safety of both body and mind. People are scared of infectious diseases. It also attacks people that we love. So it challenges our belongingness to both where we work, to the communities that we belong to, and to those that we love at home. And then last but not least, it deals with our self-esteem. There are lots of people that are out of work. There's lots of people that are relying on doctors or strangers for their care, and it affects them directly. Now, what Abraham Maslow said, and it's very clear in his theory, is that at any given point in time, if one of these basic needs is challenged, you can't be self-actualized. Now, what is a state of self-actualization? This is very important. Self-actualization is you being able to creatively problem solve, but also, this is important, to actually be able to accept and rationalize factual information. Now, you hear this. This is important. See, Abraham Maslow knew that at any time in life, if one of these basic needs is being challenged, your cognitive abilities to be able to rationalize and accept facts are going to be inhibited. They're going to, they're going to be challenged. And so your job or a job during this right now is to begin to assure or ensure that people have access to what they need to live, the, the basic needs. Now, again, we've seen this before. I started my career in HIV AIDS in San Diego, California, doing testing and counseling of those who were positive and working in hospice with people who were dying from a condition where the stigma was so bad that they would die alone. Their parents wouldn't even show up to be with them as they died. And our mission was not to let people die alone. It is normal for people in a community to fear an infectious disease. They fear it. And after they fear it, they begin stigmatizing anyone that could be associated with it. So healthcare workers, be careful. Because I know many of you are working on the front lines. Not only are you heroes, but when you get off work, you would expect somebody would hug you, to embrace you, to love you. But if you're anywhere near a patient that's sick with this, they will stigmatize you. They may not let people play with your kids or sleepovers. Get ready, because that will happen, and it did. It happened to postal employees during anthrax. It happened to people who were living with HIV during the days of HIV and the strong stigma and fear associated with that. It happened to children. Ladies and gentlemen, this is normal human behavior. And here's the worst part. Not only do they fear it and stigmatize it, but then they will deny all scientific evidence, all of it. They won't listen to science. They'll listen to the news. They'll listen to, I mean, they would even listen to Jerry Springer right now. They will listen to an athlete. They will listen to people that don't have the education or information 
to make very valid scientific conclusions about the risk that we're facing. So what is the goal of what I wanna teach you today? The goal I wanna teach you today is to give you some psychological words and framing messages that are gonna control for the outrage and allow people to rationalize facts, to accept facts better simply with words. Now, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about training at the end, but I want to focus on how do we address the noise. Now, remember what noise is. Noise is at any given point in your life, if a basic need is challenged, it produces a noise, a desire to behave, to respond until that need is met. That's what noise is. So if you take a person, you challenge their basic needs, it produces noise, it produces the desire to behave. Now the question is, do they behave appropriately? or do they behave inappropriately? If they behave appropriately, it reduces risk. If they behave inappropriately, it increases risk. So our goal as providers is to make sure those that we are serving produce or, or begin behaving in ways that minimize their risk. Now, I've got good news for you. This is not just for COVID-19. I want you to use it for future patients that you're trying to motivate or calm down. If someone is not behaving and you need them to behave, use the increase noise. If someone is behaving, overbehaving, you're overworried, use the decrease noise. And if you're in relationships, husband, wives, boyfriend, girlfriend, partners, whatever, it doesn't matter, you can use these as well. So I always love to use this. My wife comes in, she's angry. The very first thing I do when she's angry, I see she has noise. Some basic need was challenging her. I say, listen, you're in control here. You're in control. I want you to do whatever you feel you need to do right now. And remember, while you're doing that, we've been here before. We're familiar with this. We have experience in doing this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd love to be the, 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 the person to accept responsibility for those psychological terms that reduce noise in individuals, but I can't take that, uh, that credit. That's Peter Salmon, Vincent Cavelli. These are the gurus of risk communication. And they talk about these psychological factors, which we know have a direct impact on blood pressure, heart rate, and how people are processing overall risk. So if you want people to slow down, remind them, we're familiar with this. We've gotten through this before. We will get through it again. It's not affecting our children. The science is very clear. Our children seem to be safe, much safer than everyone else, okay? The effects of this, if in 99.9% .9 of people are reversible. They will recover and live a healthy life, a healthy life. We're learning a lot, we're getting better. That's mess, these are messages that decrease noise among those we serve. If you wanna increase noise, you simply say, this is out of control. We have never seen anything like this. We are, I go to work and I dread having to go to work every day. And the impacts of this are irreversible. We will never ever get over this. If you frame your messages about a particular risk in a certain way, you're either going to increase that noise, that desire, that need to behave, or you're gonna decrease it. The question is, is where is that person's perception of the risk? Is it where science is? If it's where science is, leave them alone. If their perception of this risk is below science, then increase their noise. If their perception of risk is above science, then decrease their noise. You get to decide that. But whatever you do when you speak, I want you to speak quickly, I want you to speak frequently, and I always want you to speak with empathy. During times of emergencies like this right now, over communication is always the best approach. Speak more, not less. When you find something new, speak quickly, always frequently, as often as you can. And again, try to put yourself in other people's perception or um, other people's positions. All right, message strategically. Look, this image is no control. Children can get very sick from emerging infectious diseases. Protect them by teaching children to wash and sanitize their hands frequently. This one increases noise and this one decreases noise. Experienced, we've done this before and are doing it again. Emerging infectious diseases happen frequently. Teach your children to watch. So again, people can, look, look Fox News and CNN, y'all know that, that there's not a straight agenda here, ladies and gentlemen, all right? And, and, and again, it's not meant to offend journalism in any way. 
They can take truthful information, they don't lie, and they basically use psychological wording to either increase or decrease noise based on particular topics. And if we all know that they all have individual agendas, the reality is, is what is the agenda today? And personally, I think we're increasing a lot of noise. Now, I wanna give you a very expensive slide. This slide is based on what we know the human brain does when they're trying to process information that is in an emergency situation. Meaning, what, when, when, when I'm trying to figure out what's going on during an emergency, how do, I, how do I do this? So, well, here's what you do. You're gonna deliver a message. And I want you to, I'm gonna put it in context of a family member because it works with teenagers and it works with partnerships and marriages as well. Let me explain. If you always start your message with empathy, ladies and gentlemen, right now, it is an extremely tough time, unlike anything we have ever been together, anything we've ever done together. With, there are people who are losing their livelihoods, there are people who are working long hours, they're hurting themselves, they're putting themselves at risk, our hearts, our thoughts, our prayers, everything we have is with them today. That's a statement of empathy. Empathy always builds trust. Then you have to say, here's what we know. We are up against an emerging infectious disease, a novel item. We are up against something that's extremely infectious. It seems to make a lot of people sick. It doesn't seem to kill a lot of people, but it seems to make a lot of people sick. We know that contaminated surfaces and droplet transmission is the main way it, it spreads. But here's what we don't know. We don't know how many people are going to get sick. We don't know how many people are going to die. We don't know lots about the science, uh, the science of this bug. We've only known it for 100 days. But here's what we're doing about it. We are continuously taking a look at, at, at what the virus is doing. We're following it, we're tracking it. State, federal, local governments are working together. Healthcare workers, public health professionals, scientists are working together to attack this. We are committed to beating this virus as soon as we can. Stay tuned for more information. We will continuously update you on this issue. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in your brain and in your minds, we know that when you're looking for a message, when you're upset, when a basic need has been challenged, we know the very first thing you're wanting is that someone understands that you, that you are upset. You need a statement of empathy, that builds trust. Then after that, people wanna know, well, what is it that you know? Well, here's what we know. And then when they start seeing that, they wanna know, well, what is it you don't know? Here's what we don't know. Well, what is it you're doing about it? Well, here's what we're doing about it. Okay, okay, I can deal with that, but I is this it? No, we are committed to continually be. Now, if you use this in your marriage as well, or, or even with teenagers, it works beautifully. Yes, honey, I can see that you're in pain. I, I You're frustrated. I, I, it's hurting me seeing this. I, you know, I'm, I'm upset that you're upset. You know, you're trying to make a statement of empathy, but here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. And here's what I'm doing about it. And I'm committed to you. I'm committed to trying my best. If you do communication like this, when people are outraged and upset, it gives them what they need to move forward in, in a way that is le causing less outrage. It's assuring their basic needs and it's allowing for them to process and rationalize risk accurately and effectively. And that's critical. It's very critical, especially during this time. Now, another thing that you're going to see as a service provider is you're also going to be asked, well, what would you do? What would you do in this situation? Please don't ever give them the answer of what you would do. Just recently, I had somebody who contacted me and said, Sean, I'm 59 and a half. I'm 59 and a half. You're saying 60 years old. I'm 59 and a half. What does that mean? Does that mean I should listen to you as though I'm 60? What do I do? And, and it's hard. That's, I want to answer for them, but I don't know their life. I don't know if they have children. I don't know if they have pre-existing medical conditions. I don't know what their overall risk tolerance is. So my answer to them is it's not about me. It's about you. Let me give you the information you need to make a decision that's best for you and your family. You want to encourage people to take care of themselves. Don't build a dependency on you. Don't do that. Build skills and abilities within them to make decisions that's best for themselves. 
And that means that you're not going to fix people because they're broken and you're, you're not going to help people because they're unable. No, what you're going to do is you're going to assume, you're going to do things with people and by people, not to them and for them. And so as a provider, when people need to make decisions or they're processing their own issues, serve them during that time. Walk them through that, okay? Meaning don't let them become dependent on you. Walk them through so that when they make a decision, it's the best decision for them. And let me tell you why too. Because if you make the decision for them and something goes wrong, they're gonna come back and blame you. Whereas if you walk them through and give them the information they need and they make the decision that's best for themselves, not only will they become better compliant with that decision and that behavior, but they also, if something goes wrong, will be creative enough to begin addressing it on their own as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I can, as a behaviorist, just say, well, there, I've given you communication skills to minimize outrage. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we address behavior, too. It's very hard for me to witness some of the things that I've watched. You know, in 2014, I had a chance to serve Emory Healthcare. Um, uh, during the first two cases of the Ebola outbreak. And then I went to Liberia and worked uh, with healthcare providers on the front line there as well. It breaks my heart. And, uh, and, 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 and I wrote a book uh, on this, and I know it's a CE unit, but I had to tell you this. Um, the reason why is, and the book is dedicated to infectious disease pioneers, nurses, doctors, public health professionals. Look, we, we've had our warnings, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there was SARS, there was H1N1, there was Ebola. We had our warnings. Healthcare providers are not prepared for emerging infectious diseases. I will give you that you're prepared for HIV. I'll give you you're prepared for hepatitis. I'll give you that you're prepared for bloodborne pathogens that occurred in the 80s. But when it comes to things like this, macro and micro droplets, or things like extremely resistant forms of tuberculosis, anthrax, brucella, plague. These bugs that we're dealing with that are emerging infectious diseases that require exhaustive PPE countermeasures and triage strategies is simply not ready. And we're seeing that. And so when I talk about training, what I'm looking first and foremost is before anyone ever enters into a hospital or you service anyone, in my opinion, you should make sure you're healthy first and foremost. Do you have a fever? Do you have anyone at home that is symptomatic right now? If the answer is yes to either one of those, you should not be serving. With people being 25% asymptomatic, if you have people at home that are demonstrating symptoms, we would assume potentially you've had an exposure and you therefore should not be serving others. When you go to serve others, you should screen them. Do they have a fever? How is their home? Proper screening is critical, not only for the protection of the workforce, but also to know the threat of the patients you're seeing. Even though sometimes you think they're healthy, the reality is if they're coming from a home where people are symptomatic, they may not be. And you better make sure that when you're working with them, you know the threat you're facing. Proper triage. One thing that is blowing me away is it's clearly evident with science that putting a bunch of people in a confined space increases risk. We should be using space. It should be, we should go, we, we, the, the solution for pollution is dilution. We, when we were in West Africa doing Ebola, when I've worked on cholera outbreaks, when I've worked on all sorts of, we use space. We don't even bring the patient into the building until we know exactly what they need. We sit them six feet, not even six, 10 feet. We have a conversation with them. You go left or you go right based on the interview questions. You're screened and until we know exactly what we are gonna do with them, exactly what we're gonna do with them, we don't let them in the building. Now, a lot of people say, well, Sean, that's a lot of people gathering outside. Keep them in their cars. And if they wanna wait in line, encourage them to wait six feet from one another, but don't, I'm talking about the protection of you as healthcare providers. That's what hurts me the most. Y'all are, you have the courage in, in West Africa, a story, true story, uh, Maybelline and Moses. I, I, I walked into a clinic that was abandoned in the middle of West Africa. I heard loud screaming. I thought for sure it was Ebola. Two nurses greeted me. They were giving birth to a baby in an abandoned hospital, no PPE, right in the height of the Ebola outbreak. And, and they said to me, 
Babies don't stop because outbreaks occur. We have to do what we can do. And I said, yeah, but you know, when people have Ebola, they abort their babies. And said, yes, we know, but what do you do, Sean? We, we serve. You know, y'all, that's why you're heroes. You have the courage that's unmatched. You put yourself at risk for a lot of things that a lot of people don't even understand or know. But on the other side of the hospital, there was an Ebola patient and her name was Maybelline. And Maybelline was in latent stage disease. She also was a delivery nurse who got sick delivering babies. Her husband would not leave her side. And though Maybelline would die, her husband would tell me that she didn't want to die alone and I wasn't going to last. She wasn't afraid of Ebola. She just never wanted to die alone. Look, I am and have dedicated a lot of my time since 2014 trying to get healthcare workers to be more aware of these emerging infectious disease threats. And it's one thing to throw personal protective equipment out, but how you use it and how you don and doff it, that matters so much. You have no idea because you just contaminate those that gear and then you get sick. And trust me, in 2014, I was able to, and I was very lucky to serve on Nina Pham's lawsuit against the hospital, the two nurses that got sick in Texas, and listening to how she handled her personal protective equipment was very scary. It was very scary. That's how I believe she got sick. That's how I believe Amber got sick because Duncan, the patient they were serving, never had any uh, uncontrollable bouts of diarrhea or excessive bleeding. So some way, somehow, they came in contact with fluids from a very infectious patient and that contact caused them to get sick. Look, the reality is, is that you do need proper protection. And right now it's clearly evident, eyes, nose, and mouth. Protect your eyes, nose, and mouth. No matter what you, I don't care if you put a paper bag, eyes, nose, and mouth, okay? Not only for you, but for everybody around you. When you have a lot of people working in tight spaces, contaminated surfaces will occur unless eyes, nose, and mouth are protected. And I think that's absolutely important. And please, if you're going to don and doff your gear, please don your gear from clean to dirty. The cleanest gear goes on first, followed by gear that's maybe being reused. So put your gloves on before anything you're reusing and always doff dirty to clean. Now, remember, you can sanitize your gloves. So and being that it's a lipid envelope virus, that's a good thing. But you always doff your gear from dirty to clean. The dirtiest pieces come off first sanitizing your gloves between each step. But the reality is, is that there's so much that we need to teach. The last thing I wanna leave uh, before I end, and again, I'm gonna take as many questions as you guys want to give me, that's fine. I'm gonna, I'll do whatever I can, is this, you, you've gotta maintain a proper, this is a new norm for now, ladies and gentlemen. Manage those expectations. This is not going away anytime soon. And personal protective equipment may not be on their way for another couple weeks. And the same goes with the cases are probably going to go up. You're going to see a lot more death. There's going to be a lot of bad things coming your way. Manage your expectations as though you're running a marathon. Because if you assume that it's going to get better anytime soon, it's going to fall below what you're expecting. And when you begin having expectations that are not met, it affects your attitude in the sense that it affects the way you see things in this world and what you choose to do in this world. If you manage those expectations and know that we are truly up against a real threat, we may not have what we need for quite some time. We are serving on the front lines of emerging infectious diseases and we could, we could get sick from what it is we're working with. It. The reality is, is by managing those expectations and understanding the real threat, you're gonna be in a far better place from a cognitive and attitude standpoint than you would if you actually believe in something that simply isn't true. Ladies and gentlemen, I can assure you that this is not going to go away anytime soon. You will not be able to hide in a closet and one day come out and this is gone. We will have better solutions and better strategies in the days and weeks to come. But in the meantime, again, I wanna say thank you. Thank you for your service, your dedication. Thank you for everything that you do. Uh, I know all of you, are working long hours, you have families that are very concerned about you, and again, my prayers, my thoughts, everything that I have is with you as you fight this emerging infectious disease. At that point, Judy, I think uh, what I'll do is I'll take questions if you, uh, if you have any, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. 
I believe it's five o'clock somewhere. Uh, so <laughs> enjoy uh, your Fridays. Enjoy it. Absolutely. Shana, that was great. Thank you so much. You. We do have questions. And folks, if you have more questions, keep keep them coming because we've got Sean right now. Let's make <laughs> him sit here and, and work. Let's start with this first one that we haven't answered. So any of these questions that we could answer ahead of time, we've typed answers to everybody. Absolutely. Can a sterile procedure be done wearing a CAPR capper? Yeah. I'm used to cappers. Since yeah. um, this is uh, a fan and a helmet, most of my coworkers failed the fit test for N95, which makes it difficult to do our job in rule out or COVID-19 rooms. So what's the question? Can a sterile procedure be done with a capper? Yep, that's it. Does, does everybody know what a capper is? Should I get one? I've got one here. I've got plenty of them actually here. Yeah, put one on. Don that, baby. Yeah. All right, but you're going to have to, you know what? You're going to have to give me two minutes to do it. It takes two minutes to get it. So would that be okay? Two minutes? Oh, they're going to have to listen to me sing. I know. Go ahead and sing. I'll be right back. No, you guys don't want to. I'll be back for the capper. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. So let's go through a couple other questions in here just to make sure everybody has the answers we already gave. The re this will be um, this recording will be put up on Ava Academy next week, and you guys can are welcome to go there and share that for other people to go see. A um, let's see, let's see what else we could answer as well. Uh, someone did ask me how they can or um, register for the upcoming webinars. They all go out on our social media platforms as well as um, member emails. If you want to be on our email list and you're not a member of AVA National, then if you want to send an email to AVA ED, just like it sounds, AVA ED at AVAinfo.org, we can make sure you get some emails sent out on that. So what else do we have here? Oh, uh, one thing I did want to let you guys know, we haven't um, solidified all the details, but we are planning on doing what we're calling as a coffee talk. Oh my goodness, he's back. So we'll let you know as that comes. Okay. This is a capper. All right. It's a positive pressure respirator. So what you've got, you've got your full face shield. You've got a HEPA filter on the top here. Air is coming in, it's coming down over the eyes and it's, uh, it's uh, causing, uh, Again, it's a positive pressure respirator. It's not negative. It's easier to breathe in here than it is outside. And so the question is, can we do sterile procedures with these on? I, I believe you can. In fact, this is exactly what uh, the Emory providers wore in Ebola, only they had a shroud uh, using the Max Air systems, very similar. Uh, but this is uh, uh, what a capper system is. Thank you. You're I welcome. I like a little um, show and tell on that. That's awesome. Yeah. Very good. So that was answered. We're gonna to go to the next one. No, um, I'm an RN who works in Australia in an occupational physician company um, community. I'm finding a very small amount of COVID-19 confirmed. Huge amount of patients are within the viral flu parameters, five known. Is this the inability to properly test causing the community overloading with people non-COVID-19 um, URTI slash LRTI, one okay. in hospital testing. How can we better manage testing that prevents unnecessary, uh, unnecessary panic influx? And will USA embrace telemedicine as an option to calm the panic? Australia seems to be adopting this approach. Well, I think we're already are. I think a lot of clinics in, in the United States have gone tele, teleclinicking. I think it's a, a very, very, telemedicine is, I think, an exceptional thing. You, if you're not doing it, you should strongly consider it. Uh, that would be my opinion. Um, and I've seen health clinics do this. One of the things that I think is a fair statement, if you've got tests, so say, for example, you're like South Korea. Um, anybody who wants a test can get it. If your tests are limited, now, please hear me out. I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm going to be very direct here. If you have limited tests, limited tests, you're only going to test the sickest of the sickest, meaning the people who are the most symptomatic. 
what are you going to do by bringing a bunch of people to a, one place and 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 talk to them about you're you're going to be providing more psychological therapy than anything else and you should be prepared to do that because all a person should do if they show up and are feverish in a hospital meaning they show up they say i have a fever you suspect it could be influenza okay uh, those individuals should be told okay it's time for you you know Thank you very much for showing up. We've done the best that we could with you. We never even had to have you enter the hospital. We've, we've screened you. We think that you could either have influenza or COVID. We don't have the test that we can give to you. Uh, we would like for you to go home. If you have any difficulty breathing, uh, please choose to come back. Let's, ex let's explain what that difficulty is and, and, be, and, and be ready because those people will leave and some will come back and they'll say, I am having difficulty breathing. Uh, and at that point, you're going to have to start doing the medical tests that look at oxygenation and the number of, of, of breaths per minute and make a determination on whether or not that difficulty is real or not. But again, and it's very important, I see a lot of people gathering at hospitals who simply should be told, go home. There is, there's not much that we can do for you here. And you being here is causing another potential infection to occur. And we see that, we see, I mean, we're, we're seeing that. We're seeing hospitals shut down to one door at entry access. We're seeing all sorts of, uh, of problems that could be occurring as a result of triage. So again, if you can screen, if you can screen using space, distance, outside of your facilities, push the threat further away from the asset, which is the hospital. And when you bring a threat into that asset, make sure it's controlled. That's the key. Again, a very important lesson that I, I don't think that we have yet that isn't being implemented in healthcare. Thanks, Sean. I have a question that, this is mine actually. If we have a, a patient that is has symptoms of COVID, they've been ordered a test, but yet the testing results don't come back for nine to 10 days. And many of those are coming back negative. <clears throat> are, and I know there's a high correlate or a high false negative with these tests, but is that testing period have anything to do with it, in your opinion? I, the, I long, the long time between, the queue of waiting to get the test processed. I, 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 I have to tell you, let me just, I'm gonna summarize Vera. I don't, the answer is I don't know, but I will tell you this, our testing, we, ladies and gentlemen, we got hammered. I mean, look, one of the lessons, again, two of the most important lessons we've learned I think healthcare workers need better preparedness. Um, we need to take care of them better. But the second one is our science, we've got, we got hammered. Our surveillance systems are behind. We cannot be a, a disease that we're chasing. We have to stay ahead of it. And when we, we can't with our testing systems do that, um, we're gonna always be chasing numbers. And so you're absolutely right. And the worst part about this is, is that when you start testing people, you're bringing them in and, and you're testing them, uh, you're putting a, a, a big weight on, 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 on healthcare, uh, meaning the people who provide the test, uh, and then you're not getting data uh, that you can follow up on, meaning if you get a case that's five to 10 days old, con, contact tracing, it's already too, it's gonna be too right. late. So oh. it, it's very tough. Do you believe, do you, I think you may have answered this, but do you believe that span? Because there's a backlog. No, I, I don't. I don't think tests that are sitting around waiting go inactive. Meaning, if what you're saying is because the test does not get handled uh, within a certain period of time, uh, we won't be able to detect whether they were positive or not. No, typically the tests uh, that that laboratory and C in using PCR is an is an inactive strain, and what that means is just like we knew on the cruise ship the 17 days on the cruise ship, we're looking for RNA signatures that match COVID-19 aspects. So they're usually working with inactivated strains that will, you know, that will show up even in long periods of time. Thanks. You're welcome. Would the, <laughs> would the reproductive rate not be higher if it was airborne slash micro droplet transmission? Uh, look, when, when, when you look at airborne transmission, uh, uh, again, um, if you're looking at aerosolization, you're looking at agents that spread by you breathing that in and getting it deep in your lungs and causing an infection within the pulmonary system. The, and you guys will probably know a lot more about those than I, I just know when we work in BSL-3 and BSL-4 laboratories, that's what we're most prepared with. Um, I think, honestly, 
that uh, what we're seeing is evident of micro macro droplet transmission, not of aerosol. And, and what I mean by that is, is that um, it, it the, it's hard to it's hard to put into words, but the amount of transmission that's occurring has to be coming from contaminated surfaces, touching uh, common surfaces, um, and and then touching portals of entry, um, which by the way the science already indicates. So I think that if it was something like tuberculosis, um, uh, or you know what here as classic example, brucella. Brucella is an extremely infectious agent that spread through aerosol extremely it's a low dose it takes just a small amount to make you sick with that um I, I i again could not imagine anything of this extent occurring with brucella uh the way we're seeing with this meaning this stuff likes to live on surfaces for up to three days especially in ideal circumstances not outside that's why i love outside so the fact that it can live on on surfaces for up to three days i'm telling you right now it just means that people are touching surfaces that have viable virus and then touching portals of entry some way somehow it's entering the body all right so we need to camp out <laughs> or wipe surfaces down frequently and protect your eyes nose and mouth that's okay key. I would do that too yeah so we have many more um do you believe that we will see another peak of the virus once shelter in place is lifted or people get tired of the isolation. Yes, unfortunately, and, and, and believe it or not, we're already seeing that in China um, and people aren't reporting that. Uh, yes, I do. And, and the reason why is I think this virus loves us. Uh, and I think when you look at models of epidemiology, there's a SIR model, it's called a susceptible infected and then recovered model. And what you see is, is that as the population becomes more and more infected, the susceptibility, the numbers of susceptibility in that population drop uh, because we do expect people would have immunity very similar to what we saw in SARS coronavirus one, very similar to what we see in the macaques with SARS coronavirus two, that there is immunity that is given naturally by being sick with this virus and then getting over it. So as more people become infected, this, the numbers of people in a population that can get sick again begins to drop. So we'll see dropping in susceptibility, increases in infection, uh, and then to a certain extent, those will drop down and then the recovery rates will be very high. I think that again, um, it will not be sustainable to continue doing what we're doing. Uh, something's going to have to change. And I, and I don't know what it'll be, but um, the amount of uh, uh, economic loss and strife on individuals at this point um, is hitting a tipping point. There's going to have to be a, a change in strategy and, and uh, I would expect one in, in the next two weeks. That would be my opinion. Thank you. Should nurses over the age of 60 be caring for COVID positive patients? In my opinion, absolutely not. In my opinion, absolutely not. Now, I also am a big believer in it's your right to choose and risk tolerance, but I think that if you're a nurse and you uh, are aware of the scientific evidence that suggests that if you are a comorbid uh, with any one of the conditions we've mentioned, diabetes, heart disease, uh, um, uh, um, uh, respiratory disease, asthmatic conditions, you're fighting cancer or over the age of 60, um, I think that it's fair to say to you, hey, um, I want you to understand what the science is pointing to. I mean, keep in mind, we've got, uh, 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 mil uh, I think we're up to a million now. We've got hundreds of thousands of cases worldwide where science is very conclusive. This disease picks on a certain group of people. And if you are a frontline uh, healthcare worker uh, who falls within the category that gets picked on, uh, I would say be very aware and, and be very cautious in the work that you do with, uh, and keep in mind, even in that s special group is a small percentage of those that experience severe disease. But again, I, I, I believe in caring for the healthcare workers and I think you should have the right to choose. Absolutely, and, and there's a correlation with ACE inhibitors as well. So if we have a 60 year old that's hypertensive on ACE inhibitors, that's diabetic, that... <laughs> It's, uh, look, again, it, and, and, and what their literature has found, and thank you for bringing this up, Judy, it's true, is that the more comorbid conditions you have, the greater your risk is. So it's not just having one. If you have age plus diabetes, heart disease, I mean, the more, the more you have in that category, the greater your overall risk is. Thank you. 
So I think along those lines. I think, yeah, um, I think like we'll switch on and off asking questions. Yeah, gonna go yep, go ahead. Uh, with uh, kind of like an uh, immunocompromised patient. So the question here was, how does this virus affect antiretroviral treated patients uh, living with HIV? Are they at higher risk if they are good fair health? So a uh, question is, so if, if patients are on antivirals already, uh, there has been in vitro studies done and demonstrated great benefit in labs that antiviral drugs work. Uh, and if somebody is taking their, in full compliance, their antivirals, it typically means the viral load uh, for HIV is going to be extremely low. Their immune system should be a somewhat normal function. Um, and the reality is, is that we're trying to determine whether immunocompromised individuals uh, are, um, uh, are at the highest risk here. And, and the reason why is because people die from a cytokine uh, an over response of the immune system, not an under. So it's a very complicated uh, aspect to, to talk about. But to answer your question in short, um, I would think that people who are already taking antivirals for HIV specifically um, seem to be, uh, there seems to be protection in, in vitro, meaning people who take this in early onset of disease uh, stops the replication and viral loads to a point where they don't have a severe case of disease. So I would say that there's some ample evidence that they would be protected if they were taking those drugs. Okay. okay, here's a biggie. How should we handle our dirty uniforms when we get home? Uh, what a good question. Beautiful question. I hope you have a garage because my answer is very, very clear. If you can take your dirty uniforms off before you leave, that's ideal. Um, but if you get home, uh, I would strongly recommend taking off your uniforms in a very specific way, by the way. If you take your shirt off and you flip it and the outside of your shirt is going to hit your face, you're not doing yourself any favor there. So you're going to want to kind of grab your collar and pull it off over your head. You're going to want to just put it in a bag that you can handle and do laundry at a later time. Uh, because we know, again, that this agent, macro droplets, can live on surfaces uh, not, uh, not as long as plastic or hard surfaces, uh, three days, but it can um, and does. And so I would take it off, making sure that you don't flip your shirt inside out. If you bring your shirt up and you're touching your face with your shirt, What's on your shirt could be touching your face at this point. So how you take it off will matter. I also would leave your shoes outside as well. So shoes and pants and, and just go into the house and sanitize and wash your hands immediately. Take a shower would always be a great practice. And then when you do that laundry, if you feel that it could be contaminated, make sure that you know you, you wear your, I always, again, eyes, nose and mouth, protect eyes that don't care how you do it. Doesn't need to be a mask. I always love my daughter's hair ties. She has these big hair things and she, I put them over my nose and my mouth and wear glasses as well. My son works at Publix. It's a grocery store and he's only 16 years old and he's doing work right now in the middle of this and I've given him ample protection not using a mask as well but protect your eyes, nose and mouth. Put it in the laundry, put it in the washer. Should be perfectly fine washing normal clothes with normal detergent. Again, lipid envelope virus won't activate and do just fine. So I think it's interesting too, like along these lines, what do you do with your uniforms? Um, we talk about this in hazmat training, uh, bioterrorism stuff uh, in emergency departments and uh, emergency preparedness groups. And it's almost like a hot zone, warm zone concept where you're leaving the hot zone of the hospital environment or uh, maybe your isolated patient environment, however you have it established in your organization and then what do you do with your your clothes as you're going home so sean thanks for going sure. into some detail yeah about that. you're welcome i agree with that concept 100 percent. get get used to a, make a, a good change area in the garage <laughs> what goes to work with you does not go into the house including your shoes you better show your neighbors give your neighbors a show when you get off uh, work you know, yep yeah, you gotta yeah, do what you have to do that's right exactly <laughs> tough times uh, how about this? If if a healthcare worker tests positive but is asymptomatic, should they be quarantined? Well, uh, I think that the, here's the problem. If your test is 10, 10 days old, uh, you know, the reality is, is that you have to look at the uh, last uh, day that you were symptomatic and go, you know, go 14 days. I would strongly recommend doing what CDC has said that you do. You go 14 days. Um, some people will say, well, yeah, but CDC's thing also says that you can go 10 days, but you wear a mask for those four days. I hate that. Why would you wear a mask? 
You know, that's when I've said providers get mad at me and they're like, well, I want to come back 10 days and wear a mask. And then I say to them, well, why are you wearing a mask? Well, I guess potentially because I could be spreading it. Yeah, exactly. So why would you want to go back to work if you could be spreading it? It doesn't make sense to me. It's a 14 days post the uh, post the, the presentation of fever. And, uh, and, and that's what the recommendation is. We also saw that with SARS coronavirus one. Um, so typically you're, you know, if you look at the clinical presentation, uh, 14 days uh, and you're no longer shedding virus. Now keep in mind, there's evidence that su suggests you do shed the virus in fecal uh, material, sometimes up to 40 days afterwards. So make sure you do practice good hand hygiene when you return to work. We're not given N95 masks to care for positive COVID patients. We're told it's not necessary. I feel this is putting caregivers at risk and what can we do to get these? So it's a good question. And, um, and so what can you do to get these? You can, you can keep requesting them and sooner or later the supply may come in, but I do wanna caution you. I, I, I really, really do. N95s uh, are, are overrated in a lot of ways. Number one, are you fit tested? Number two, does the filter fit your face? Number three, when you smile or laugh, your filter has a break. Number four, do you have a beard? Uh, number five, are you sure you really want a negative respirator? And what do I mean by that? When you look at what the science is pointing to, if you are protecting your nose, your mouth, and your face, even with a surgical mask, a barrier, I always love a surgical mask and a face shield because the face shield is gonna cover that surgical mask and it's gonna allow for that surgical mask to be reused and not necessarily gonna be dirty. Again, you're focusing on micro macro droplets. And, and if you rely on your PPE as the only, this is another big mistake I think healthcare workers are making. There should be several, several things put in place to offer redundancy of safety to you. You should not be in a tight room with a patient that's COVID positive. You should be in a large space. You should be using distancing. As you, the only time you should be touching or coming in that patient's space is when you have to do something. And the, and the reality is, is that this constant in and out, in and out, in and out of touching, South Korea learned this with MERS. They had a super spreader of 80, for that one patient they were treating, 80 healthcare workers got sick they realized you don't have in and outs. You treat a patient and PPE is always your last line of defense. It's not your first. So um, when you look at that, even though you feel the desire for an N95, and I respect that, I'd want to give you what you feel you need. The science doesn't support it. And so be careful because a lot of people are putting a lot of false premises on N95s and 95s when really it comes down to we got micro macro droplets. We want to protect anything that has ACE2 receptors because of the spike proteins, and that includes our eyes, nose, and mouth. So if we have a barrier protection over those things, we should be fine. We really should be. Sean, I just want to clarify that because I'm, that confused me just a skosh. Um, yeah. I might be on the lower end of that curve, by the way, on this one. But okay, yeah. So if I have a positive patient, it's not necessary for me to have an N95. Look, I'm not, I'm not going to argue what CDC is debating or what they're saying. What I'm saying is, is if you put a mask on a positive person who's COVID positive, they, they have a mask on. Any droplet, a regular, mask. Yeah, a regular mask. A regular mask. Any droplets that they're going to produce is going to be captured in that mask, meaning you are minimizing the contamination of the environment that they're working in. And keep in mind, Healthcare workers that are getting sick, a lot of people are saying, well, we're getting sick because we don't have N95s. We're getting sick. Listen, let me tell you something. What I'm witnessing from a behavioral standpoint is, is that even if you had N95s, you'd be getting sick because of the way you're taking your gear off. There are people that are touching dirty parts of their gear and contaminating their hands, and they're not even doing it with the proper flow that was mentioned earlier from clean to dirty and dirty to clean. And so there's so many different contact points and ways that you could get exposure to this that I'm very concerned that it's not an N95 issue, that it's really how you're behaving around contaminated PPE. And, and by the way, we know this. Healthcare workers every year, 1.2 or 1.7 million healthcare associated infections, 1.7 with over 100,000 deaths every year in the United States associated with infections picked up in, in hospitals. So we know C. diff, MRSA, thank goodness this stuff is easier to inactivate than those things because it is, and it's very easy. We just have to be very proactive. I appreciate that, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. 
So uh, here, here's one from, I'm from Pakistan. How can we control religious people who do not want to compromise skipping their group pair, uh, prayers? Yeah, that's a, that's a brilliant question. I do a lot of work in Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum to you. I hope you're doing well. Um, look, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it's going to be difficult. Um, and why? Because a uh, basic challenge to basic needs, religion is a basic need that a lot of people have. Um, and I think that this is where uh, you are going to have to come in from a governmental aspect and you're going to have to say, okay, what is the best thing from a public health standpoint? Everybody has the right to pursue a, a, a life of good health. Uh, your question is very difficult to answer because, number one, I know there's uh, cultural differences, uh, having been to Pakistan many, many times. Uh, number two, you don't want to discourage prayer and connection with Allah or with any God that you are loving and serving in, in, the, in, in the life that you're living. Um, but you're trying your best to request that people, for the meantime, while, uh, while this threat is very real, you're trying to request that they respect the fact that this can be uh, a trend. So maybe instead of saying no, maybe giving them ideas on how they can do this type of worship, um, in a safer way. That may be a better way to go. Yeah, I think that goes along with your discussion about noise and how to kind of bring the conversation to the science and perception level. That's correct. That's correct. Sean, there's a lot of confusion with signs and symptoms that, yeah. you know, I've got body aches and a sore throat and it, it tears in and it's different from you than it is to me. And how do we how do we get to the point where we say, okay, you have this constellation of symptoms, you're not going to get admitted to the hospital, you don't need an OT right now. Where do we find that balance point of let's go get a test or what what kind of advice can you give for that? Well, first and foremost, I think that the the one thing that blows me away still is that psycho psychiatric and psychological services have not been called to the forefront yet. In my opinion, I would argue, and many, many, many healthcare providers may even say that 70% of the people they're seeing need those services more than anything else. And, and first and foremost, I would answer the first question would be, do we have tests available? And if the answer is no, meaning we are, we, we have only a limited number of tests and only the sickest of the sickest are going to be tested, then anyone who fits that criteria that you're describing, Judy, in my opinion, once they have been once medical services have been ruled out, meaning there's really not much we can do for this person here, meaning they're not suffering from another infection, they're, they're, it's not life-threatening, this is an individual we're about ready to turn home, not test, because we, we just simply don't have the capabilities to do that. I'm going to refer you now to psych services. Now, you don't have to call it psych services. I'm going to refer you to our, our yellow team over here. And that yellow team spends time sitting with them saying, here's the situation. We don't have enough tests. Uh, your, your, your category right now is a person that we're going to send home, give you a phone number, and ask you to continuously communicate how you're doing, and we'll check up on you. And that, that, that kind of care is, in my opinion, what's needed most right now in this country. Um, because we have to move those people out of the way so that the ones that really need the care can get it. And that's, and, and I think that's important. That's why triage is so important. I think so as well. But when we have these patients that have the constellation of symptoms that could be strep throat, it could be a flu, it could be the, a cold, they've got the sore throat that's getting worse. They've, they've got a mild temperature, um, a little bit of a cough, fatigue. Those could be almost anything that we've seen for years. And if they go in and get a COVID test, then they have a 10 day, nine to 10 day waiting period to get positive negative results. Personally, That's yeah, personally, I, I would be ruling out the ones that, that, that like you said, I mean, if I, if I could do a strep throat test, I'm gonna do a strep throat test. If I'm gonna, if I can do a, a flu test, I'm gonna do a flu test um, because those seem to be more readily available than a COVID test. Um, so I would, I would, I would perform those. Um, uh, because you're right. I don't want to send anybody home with a condition that could be easily treated and, uh, and, and, and have them suffer at home as a result of, uh, of that. But again, um, when you're talking about those signs and symptoms, uh, we're really looking for a very, a very specific group of people and it's going to be hard. You, we're going to have to do what we, 
we're going to have to do what we can do considering the circumstances. There's going to be people that will miss because of the True. numbers. True. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I've, I've, yeah, I've heard of people being treated presumably for strep and then get a test, but it's a 10 day waiting period and the, the treatment for strep doesn't work per se, but well, thank you. Yeah, and I okay. wouldn't let your guards down. Look, ladies and gentlemen, some of the super spreader information that's come out of South Korea as well, um, and even out of China, is that one of the ways that super spreading, meaning one person gives it to eight people, and it's typically in healthcare settings, is that we misdiagnose. So we assume because the person doesn't have a fever or a dry cough, maybe they have a fever and a productive cough, we assume they're not COVID or they're not SARS coronavirus. So we don't keep our guard up and then that individual in processing treatment causes a lot of other people to get sick so i would caution you again there's use space and 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 this is a very special time use your your skills wisely to proper triage and treat individuals don't drop your guards down because they don't fit the clinical classic presentation of this disease okay blake you're up yeah i was gonna say it's interesting to read some of the questions here and it's like a spectrum when it comes to PPE, you have people who are saying, you know, can I use the PAPR or CAPR for uh, doing a sterile procedure, which I think we came to a good answer for that question. And then you look at the other spectrum where uh, people aren't uh, allowed to use appropriate PPE for different procedures. And that, that seems alarming to me uh, as far as, you know, whenever you're doing a procedure, you should be using the most appropriate PPE for, you know, one, the procedure to the patient. Um, just kind of interesting commentary here. Well, it's uh, hurt, my, it hurts was, my heart. Before you go, I got to tell you a story. I walked to, I went into a hospital where the triage people who I don't even think were healthcare providers uh, were wearing N95s. Um, and I got in and I met somebody who was intubating and they came to me and you could tell they were very upset. And they said, we are intubating latent stage disease, COVID-19 patients, and we don't have respirators. And, and, and that, it just, it, that just blew me away. Exactly what you've said. It's kind of, wait, hold on one sec. You have triage people that can use space and distance wearing N95s, and you have people that are intubating highly infectious patients and latent stage disease without protection. That, that's happening, and that, that shouldn't. That is that is that that should not at all. There is a clear and evident difference between the two risks in those situations. So, uh, to follow up on your statement during the slides was, uh, you know, do you think that really the warning signs like you were pointing out, and we've been through a lot of different pandemics historically, um, how has that impacted our current response uh, with this pandemic? In what regard? So like, are we missing the mark? Oh, well, look, I think in, in first and foremost, you know, we're in the middle of something. So I, I don't want to uh, uh, appear critical in any way, but I but I'm I am upset. Uh, I'm very upset. I'm upset because I believe that public health professionals, nurses, doctors, um, laboratorians, uh, they're on the front lines of emerging infectious diseases. I believe that laboratories um, need more funding, uh, and, but, but do have good access to a profession that serves them from provider first. And what I mean by that is in laboratories, we have a profession called biosafety. Biosafety is centered focus on the protection of the laboratorian. Healthcare providers have a concept called infection control, and infection control is patient-centered. And when you're focused on the patient, who focuses on you? And, I, and I've come up with a concept that I talk about called clinical containment, which is a blending of infection control and uh, biosafety. And it focuses and encourages healthcare workers to focus on their safety as they fight newly emerging infectious diseases that go well beyond bloodborne precautions. And that's the risk. The risk is that we are good at dealing, in my opinion, with bloodborne, but these newly emerging infectious diseases that we're facing, the ones that are spread through droplets and aerosol, we're simply not prepared for that in the healthcare setting. And that's what makes me sad because we've got the courage and, and we've got the people who want to do it, but they're just not prepared yet to, to handle that, in my opinion. That again is my opinion, respectfully. 
I, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you. I think the people aspect of this has been very positive, whether it's, you know, healthcare workers, frontline people, pre-hospital, um, you name it, and uh, community responses, uh, supporting your local businesses in times where they have to shut down, things like that. Um, is there any uh, benefit to changing the way we do like national stockpiling or any kind of programs like that? I think that the stockpile, uh, you know, in, in emergency, you're going to have uh, the resources until you simply don't have them. Um, I think that one of the things I know that I'm going to go to the drawing board after this event is over um, and try to create solutions for healthcare to minimize the usage of PPE. See, that's one thing that we do very, very well in laboratory environments. We isolate the areas that are the, the dirtiest. We, we, we have strategies for ensuring that clean and dirty never cross. We have a, a process and a philosophy of containment that I think could truly be implemented, as you've talked about, in chemical, uh, radiological. There's a process of flow that can be implemented in healthcare to not only minimize the PPE usage, but also, again, to be provider focused, meaning we're going to focus on the safety, not only of the patient, but the safety of providers as well. That's awesome. So sterile procedures can be done with popper. <clears throat> we place picks using popper in Tacoma in Washington um, if no N95s are available. So, oh, they were just answering. Never mind. That wasn't yeah. even a question. My bad. What do you think? Oh. What do you think about FDA's recommendation found at FDA.gov? Extend the use of medical gloves for a healthcare provider without changing gloves between patients with the same infectious disease diagnosis or exposure with no other infections. Well, one of the things that we do for sterility in labs when we know our gloves are contaminated is we hand sanitize or we treat them with alcohol. Um, this is a practice we use in laboratories and, and, and in essence, it ensures sterility uh, of our processes. So this is not uh, an abnormal request by FDA. If you sterilize your gloves or sanitize your gloves uh, and you're concerned about COVID, now keep in mind, I'm not talking about MRSA, I'm not talking about C. diff, I'm not talking about things that are very, very resistant to uh, chemical inactivation. We're talking about a lipid envelope virus here, and if you took your gloves, sanitized them, and wiped sanitizer around your gloves, and then moved on, you could maintain those gloves uh, uh, just fine uh, when you go from one to another. Now, again, uh, it, I, I, I never like generalizations of things I've said. If you're doing processes that require sterility or high-risk processes where fluids will be exchanged or your gloves are completely contaminated, and you know they are, I would strongly recommend replacing them. But if you've got gloves that you don't think are highly contaminated, you're not going from one important procedure to another, I would strongly recommend considering just a decon of your outer gloves and moving on. Uh, make sure though, again, you're using a, a, a chemical that doesn't degrade the, the, the glove um, excessively. And, and we could talk more, I can get that to you, Judy. Uh, more later, but it's a technique we use in labs, and, and it was a technique we used during Ebola um, when we treated the patients at Emory Healthcare first as well. Okay. Blake, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, let's see here, a couple other, I'm looking farther down on the list to get some of the people just added. Um, what about homemade masks? What are your thoughts on those as far as appropriate PPE for yeah you know, any setting. We are at a time where you must be empowered to do whatever you think you need to do to take care of yourself and your family. Uh, I just sent my child to Publix, again, as a bagger, uh, with a hair thing that will protect his nose and his mouth and eye protection with glasses and a pair of gloves. Um, you have to do what you think you need to do to protect yourselves and your families. Now, I will tell you again, I think out of common courtesy, anytime you go outside, if, especially if you're in an area where there's high rates of infection, or um, I would protect your eyes, nose, and mouth at all times at this point. And I would cover them because you just don't want to contaminate any surfaces out there. But I think you do what you need to do. And I think you, sh you should be allowed to do at this point what you feel you need to do to protect yourself. Uh, because if you don't have PPE, 
uh, something will be better than nothing, in my opinion. Uh, depending, I, again, I, I hope you're not reversing the risk. See, a lot of people also don't know that N95s increase your blood pressure, decrease oxygen in your blood, and cause increases of carbon, uh, carbon dioxide in your, in your body as well. So sometimes we do things that increase our risk for the sake of decreasing risk. And so be careful, that's a reverse safety issue. Always make sure that what you're choosing to do is actually de decreasing your risk rather than increasing it before you choose to do it. And along those lines, what do you think about glasses versus goggles and the seal needed for that? Yeah, you know, again, a lot of people will say they know the answer to that. They just simply don't. Uh, we're doing a lot of research on macro droplets and micro droplets. I think that as long as you've got protection over your eyes, uh, you're going to protect any impact aspects of, of, of what you're working with. Now, again, if you use your PPE as the only basis of protection, then your PPE can break down. I, and I wanna say this again, why would you be in close proximity with a patient that you would suspect would be producing these macro droplets? Don't, and don't put a bunch of them in a tight space. Use a lot of spacing, use spacing between you and that person. When they talk, have them talk in a different way, maybe have them cover their mouth when they're talking. What you're doing is you're trying to implement something that minimizes the need for personal protective equipment. Don't just rely on your PPE. You've got to implement other strategies that make your PPE the last line of defense. Okay, last line of defense. Very good. Are KN95s just the same or as good as N95s? Uh, uh, they, they, uh, the 95 stands for being able to prevent if used properly, if fit properly, 95% of 0.3 micron particles. Notice it's not 100%, that's 95%, which basically also means now, again, people will make the argument that as the filter gets loaded, the efficiency goes up. I understand that, it's a very technical argument. But the reality is, is that we also know N95s fail all the time because they don't have a specific fit to the face. When you smile, laugh, you, your, your, uh, your seal is broken. If you've got a beard, hair, uh, any type of sweat sometimes. There's a lot of things that cause failures in N95s. Okay. Um, kind of not quite along those lines, but we mentioned a little earlier, the rates of false positives or false negatives. Do you know what those are running at? I, I think that people are very scared to, uh, uh, to give that information out at this point. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to simply say that testing will get better in the days to come. <laughs> that's, that's all I can say on that. That's not good. It's not okay. good. It's, it's not, not good enough right now. It's not good enough. No, no. Do you have any uh, references or resources um, willing to share with the group here about uh, donning and doffing PPE appropriately? So ladies and gentlemen, I have a YouTube channel. If you just go to seankaufman.com, you can see that. I have I have some healthcare worker YouTube. Uh, one of my favorite YouTube videos is the Beaky Method. If you're removing gloves where you're taking a glove off and with a bare hand touching a contaminated glove, I'm gonna challenge you to look at that video. It's the Beaky Method. I also have a, a, a video that I just recently posted for people who are doing uh, maintenance on machines in healthcare where they doing their face, they're protecting their face area. You want to look at that. And I also have three renditions of healthcare. There's a healthcare uh, uh, PPE uh, donning and doffing uh, set, uh, slide set that I put there on YouTube as well. So again, Sean Kaufman. Now I'm going to warn you, I'm very, very open and I create a lot of videos that tell you my, my honest opinions about things. So if you do go there and choose to dabble outside of the PPE videos, just be forewarned. <laughs> I am very opinionated and I do share my thoughts very clearly. That shocks me, I don't know. Sorry, I'm so sorry. But it's neat not having to identify with an agency. It's kind of like when you're out on your own, it can be bad business. And forgive me if I've offended anybody, please don't be afraid of me. I love open dialogue and discussion, uh, but uh, yeah, just love me even if you disagree with me, please. <laughs> I ask yeah. that. Um, is there any change in the SARS-2 genome country-wise? You know, we're not seeing that. Uh, that's a great, whoever asked that is a great question. And, you, and one of the things that is really neat. Share, by the way. Yeah. Thank you, and Bob. one of the things that's really Bob. neat that, that we've seen 
um, is, it, remember SARS uh, coronavirus one, uh, it took almost six months for us to map that genome. Uh, it didn't take very long for us to do it. And that's how far we've come in 15 years. So we, we really truly should be very amazed at our scientific community. Um, uh, science has done an outstanding job uh, uh, getting better at identifying genomes, breaking things down and understanding the real threat that we're facing. So I think that um, uh, we're not seeing transitions. Uh, do we expect mutations? Well, this is SARS coronavirus too. Uh, I pray that there's not a three. And, and if there is, I mean, keep in mind the, from what we knew from number one was that the death rate was 10%. Um, and what we knew from MERS is that the death rate, and especially among healthcare workers, the 30, 37%. Uh, we're very grateful that a lot of the models are showing that this is falling anywhere between 1% and 0.6%, and, and it could even be lower than that because we just don't know how many cases truly exist, meaning the severe cases are overrepresented and the not-so-severe cases are underrepresented, so it's very difficult for us to have a true reflection on what a death rate or mortality rate for this bug would be. Thank you. You're welcome. Look, yep. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, what are your thoughts about disinfecting? Uh, looks like in a batch used clean masks. So again, I think it goes back to uh, people reusing and disinfecting N95s or surgical masks. I think we're, again, we're at a point where we, we really truly uh, have to do what we have to do. And I really want to applaud uh, Duke University who has been a huge uh, a leader, not only in healthcare, but a huge leader in, in laboratory sciences. They have high containment labs with some phenomenal people there. And they really used vaporized hydrogen peroxide and demonstrated that a lot of masks could be used, could be uh, uh, decontaminated and it not inf affect the integrity uh, or the mask in general and be reused. Um, but I do think that there's that's not a good enough solution for everybody. Not everybody has VHP. Uh, we also need people to be able to reuse their N95s quickly. So saturating them in a particular chemical is not necessarily going to be a great recommendation either. And even in the new CDC guidelines that came out, there's recommendations of vaporized hydrogen peroxide, even though they don't necessarily know whether they work or not. Um, so we're at a point, again, where we don't have the science to support um, a proper sterilization of an N95. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please, this is where it gets complicated. And I know, and I love answering these questions and I'll do it until eight o'clock tonight, I don't care. But, and I'm sorry yeah. that I have, to, I have long, -winded, uh, long winded answers, but this is important. Decontamination means they're trying to literally kill everything in an N95. What's important to a provider, in my opinion, is that the surface area of the N95 is inactivated so that when you touch it, you're not contaminating your hands or anything else. To try and get completely into the N95 to inactivate everything that's gotten into the N95 is overboard. Um, you're not understanding how a HEPA filter works. Uh, there are many HEPA filters out there that have a lot of contamination inside the filter. We're not worried about the inside. We're always worried about the outside where it impacts. So be careful because this complete kill of everything in an N95, I think if you're wearing a face shield that covers your N95, or you're wearing even a surgical mask that covers your N95, you're just trying to keep the impact of droplets that hit the N95. It could be a risk to you at a later time. You're just trying to keep that N95's outside aspect clean enough for you to rehandle in a safe way. Again, I wouldn't handle it unless I had my gloves on, but the reality is that that's what your goal is. I think we've missed the mark. We're saturating our mass, trying to sterilize them uh, uh, against a lipid envelope virus that's very easy to inactivate. Uh, I'm not so sure that these recommendations are going to be practical for the healthcare providers. Sean, I was talking to a colleague that has been using ultraviolet to, or they're looking at the data behind it, and it looks really promising. There's a gizmo out there that I think it's a 60 second cycle to um so don't know what it does to the mask or the efficacy of that mask at that point but that could be a promising solution soon yeah uv has always been our friend three issues with uv just make sure that it only works where it touches um the other thing is is that as uv bulbs bulbs age 
uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of those bulbs go down. Um, and, and then again, last but not least, if you have any rubber or plastic items, uh, what will happen and what can happen is that uh, um, uh, you can break down those things and cause damage to those things along with your eyes as well. So be careful. Uh, don't increase risk, decrease risk as you use UV. Beautiful. Do you believe that we'll see another peak of the virus once uh, we've already spoken about that? I do. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't think this is going away, ladies and gentlemen. I wish it was, but I don't think we're going to have a phase out. I think it's it's contaminated or it's caused so many infections around the world that it's going to be around for a little bit. Okay. How about uh, sheltering in place or the shelter orders? Uh, could this have been used in previous outbreaks and had uh, more success from previous pandemics? Look, I, I'm, a, I'm a big guy that a one solution fits all approach is not a good approach. Um, I think that uh, what we're doing in this, in, in this response, um, it's, very, it's very hard to justify um, your the greatest fear people are feeling fear, fearing right now is death. Um, but the science doesn't back that up. 99.9% .9 of people that are going to get this, especially within certain populations, are going to be able to survive and thrive just fine, and and also gain immunity to it, which is another thing healthcare workers can start doing if they've tested positive. Um, you know, consider strategies as long as you're confirmed. I do a serum test to confirm that you were positive and then that you did have some immunity to it, and begin organizing your healthcare workers accordingly, but I won't go there. But the, the, the point I'm, I'm getting at though is, is that there's so many functions of society and you, you already see it. There's, you know, babies don't stop and, and, and people don't stop dying uh, uh, at the elderly, uh, don't stop needing uh, love and, and attention and, and belongingness as a result of this disease. To simply hide uh, from it um, uh, there are going to be diseases and maybe even other threats where one day shelter in place would be highly recommended for the total population. But I'm not so sure that that's the right choice here. Um, I think that it does buy time. Maybe we can get our testing services up to where it needs to be. Uh, but, but I think the burden of this uh, event has fallen on healthcare workers. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that there was a, I think there could have been a different way of, of, of handling this. But again, um, uh, we still have plenty of time left. Strategies will change. We'll see where it goes. So we'll see where it goes. It has to change. We cannot sustain what we're doing right now. It's, it's impossible. From an economic standpoint, it's simply impossible. Uh, mm -hmm. Isolation as well. Yeah. You're right. So Michelle's asking, um, because there's confusion out there, is droplet versus um, just a airborne type. Yeah. It, has it been really um come down to it is there a definitive answer on this the well so again it's it's how diseases are spread um when you look at this one it loves your mucous membranes so whether it's in big droplets or it's in little droplets that tend to float around for a little bit following you know maybe an exchange of of, of talking uh in, in moderate tones uh if those little micro droplets come in contact with mucous membranes uh, we are suspecting that that could potentially cause transmission. Now, those those micro droplets are affected by a lot of things. For example, one of the things that I would also invite healthcare workers to do is start using fans. Uh, you can control these uh, droplets by pushing them away from you. If you want a safe zone, get behind a fan. Um, I'm telling dentists right now who have to use emergency procedures, have a fan blowing into the patient um, so that any droplets that are generated are going away from you. Um, so directional airflow is, again, you're always thinking of things that you can do so that your PPE is not your, your first barrier. And so, um, so again, if you can use fans to control these droplets, that would work as well. I think so much research still needs to be done, but I think it will be now. I think we're going to find out a lot more about micro droplets in the future. And there's a lot of great data, again, coming out of South Korea about this. I can just picture something on Amazon, a visor with these two fans here. As yeah. we walk around, we're just pushing fans up. See, see Judy, innovation. That's that's it's, perfect. You're gonna have you go. people, you're gonna have people questioning sterility, but your innovation, that's <laughs> perfect. Yeah, it's absolutely perfect. I'm gonna go work on that design tonight. Yeah. 
So um, we're at, being asked is the vaccine against tuberculosis can protect against COVID? Gosh, you know, um, uh, that's inconclusive. Uh, there is rumors that countries that have uh, the TB vaccine are seeing lower cases. Uh, let's give that some time. Let's test that out and give it some time. Unsure is really uh, what we what we're what we're saying right now. Uh, we're aware of it. It's interesting, but unsure. Okay. Like what you got? Yeah. So <clears throat> I guess this is kind of like as we phase out as the you know the wishful think we're going to get through this. Uh, as we're phasing out, when do you think it, it's going to be safe to go back to somewhat normal since uh, it's not going to go away anytime soon? So uh, you what know, are the key indicators we're I, looking for? I would, well, I mean, obviously we're going to see reduction. So what I believe is going to start happening is we will get the test up and running. There, the, that's going to come. Um, that's just a matter of time. Um, once we start getting tests to a point where we turn test results around six hours, uh, you know, I, I think what what what's going to happen is hospitals, if they're already not looking at strategic plans for how they're going to continue to operate with this threat around, um, they should be looking at those now, uh, because I think that this is the new norm, at least through the summertime uh, or into summertime. Uh, so I think that I would always encourage people. And this is what, when I, when you introduced me, unconscious incompetence, let me explain what that means. It's like somebody who says, I know how to swim. I know how to swim. I, and they believe in their heart. They truly do. And then they jump in a pool and only then do they realize they don't know how to swim. So it is that they don't know what it is they don't know, but they think they know. And I would encourage hospitals around the world to reach out to your environmental health and engineering groups and contact your biosafety officers and, and ask them to help you strategize how you're going to fight this. Because again, you've got technical expertise at your healthcare settings, you really do. And if you don't, go to an academic setting where there's labs and ask them if they have biosafety professionals. I'm not plugging biosafety professionals in. Some are good, some are bad. But what I am saying is there is a profession that wakes up every single day and every single night that focuses on the health and safety of laboratorians who work with very dangerous infectious diseases every single day. That profession, as noted in this book, that profession is there and they are eager to help. And that's how Duke helped with the VHP aspects. Please don't pretend like you know what you're doing. And it's clearly obvious, it's like Einstein. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Healthcare workers are getting sick. Ask for help. That's it. It's just another set of eyes, you know? So um, a couple people have asked about, uh, do you have some good videos? And we are um, sending them over to Safer Behaviors. You have some okay. good videos on donning and doffing. No, go to Sean, go to the YouTube channel, Sean, just type in Sean Kaufman on YouTube and, and that channel will pop up. It's a Safer Behaviors YouTube channel. And that's where I post all my content there. So, and if you're in Pakistan, by the way, go to PEPSA. There's several videos that will be posted on uh, donning and doffing there in Udu and Punjab and, and uh, many other languages there in Pakistan as well. Awesome. So when going into, this is a great question. Going into a COVID positive room, should I ask the patient to put a mask on? Yes, 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 absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yes. <We're> <laughs> That's a beautiful question. And if they don't have a mask, have them cover their mouth or put a tissue over their mouth when they talk because they're generating droplets and they're going everywhere and you don't want environmental contamination and you don't want it coming near you. Great question, Judy. Yes. I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. I'm going to credit where due. Very good. So um, that was from, I'm going to give her credit, oh. Ching Wai Watkins. Strong work. Very Strong good. Work. Very good. We're going to go through a few more. I know we still have, how many people do we have? We have 260 people still on board yeah. listening. Yeah. So I yeah. think we'll go through a few too. more. Um, because people are asking some really good questions. Okay, we're coming back to anti-malaria and Z-Packs. Yeah. 
Do we have any more data on, is it working? You know, the so the anti-malaria, when you look at that medication, it actually inhibits or slows down the immune system's response, which is one of the reasons why we're still kind of trying to understand the virus and, and whether that's a good thing or not. Um, still unknown. I wish we had more data and more understanding unknown. Now, I will tell you this. I, I'm going to call a white elephant out. Why we're not using Tamiflu and antivirals that focus on uh, minimizing the replication of uh, uh, viral loads, uh, um, I don't know. Uh, this uh, baffles me. It confuses me because I know that if we get that early onset and we stop viral replication, the viral loads decrease and the likelihood of severe disease would go down as well. There are two types of antivirals, those that increase your immune system's response, which I wouldn't recommend, and those that fight viral replication. I see why I don't see why those antivirals, and I know that they're looking at them now, but I don't see why we would not be using some of those if they're readily available uh, to to again minimize uh, severity of disease among what I consider again our VIPs are vulnerable, important people uh, who are more vulnerable as a result of pre-existing conditions or age. All right. Here's uh, here's an interesting one. So. Have you seen any transmission from someone who had COVID and recovered, then passing it on to someone else from, say, contaminated gloves? No. What we've seen is uh, we've seen that uh, some people who have had COVID recovered then test positive again, uh, but that's not uh, conclusive for whether or not they can transmit the virus. So again, unfortunately, remember we've only known this virus for 100 days. Uh, there's still so much we're learning. So that that the answer that you're looking for is that we don't have just yet, but we'll get it. It's just a matter of time. You set me up for the next question. Um, one of our listeners wants to know, um, when do you think this virus actually got to the U.S.? Wow, I like that. Isn't that I a like great it. question? It's very good. Um, I think long before we knew. Uh, that's my opinion. I think it was an issue in Wuhan long before it was reported. Um, uh, I think I think it was probably around uh, a long before we knew. Uh, you don't know if some, when you're not looking for something. It's kind of like when you go outside and you truly try to activate your sense of hearing. When you truly try to zoom in and start listening to things, you begin to hear things that were always there and you just never heard. Yeah. Um, same goes here. We we weren't looking for this. So there could have been a lot of respiratory death that we would have cited off as just a respiratory disease infection or uh, maybe an un, 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 un asp, uh, unknown uh, strain of, of, of flu, uh, influenza. Um, uh, you know, we saw that with HIV looking back in past serology. When we did past serology tests, we saw HIV well before what we thought patient zero was. So I would suspect if we started doing serology and we had them on patients that died from you know, suspected uh, respiratory diseases that didn't have a necessary, uh, you know, a diagnosed condition, I bet you if we did serology, we could probably see maybe individuals would have uh, this type of uh, a virus um, long before we knew about it. That's my opinion. Perfect. Like, yep. I'm looking for a, a new question here. We've still got a lot of... Uh, okay. How, how you know what, as you look, I got one for you. Okay, so go ahead. a lot of people out there in the community are making masks. Um, I know a good friend of mine, Jill, she was making some masks, and they're trying to jury-rig it and put in bits in the middle because we don't have N95s. Um, and one of our questions here is, what would you say about integrating the filters they use in furnaces like highest rated filters i'm guys I'm, I'm i'm it makes me nervous and let me tell you why it makes me nervous um we just don't know the effects it's going to have on people and there's no we don't know the safety is we don't know you know and and again let me tell you what the science is pointing to the science is pointing to uh um um the fact that it's 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 going to be either contaminated surfaces are micro or macro droplets, which means that as long as you're covering your nose and your mouth, and you don't need a HEPA filter to do this, HEPA filters protect your lungs. As long as you're covering your nose and your mouth, um, uh, that should be sufficient. And if you wanted to wear a face shield in addition to that, that's good as well. But again, please hear me again. If you're using your PPE, 
as the only barrier in protection of this disease, whether it's an N95 or a PAPR or a, or, or a surgical mask, you will fail. PPE is not 100% proof. It's there as a protective piece of equipment that's used as part of your plan for safety, not your plan of safety. Okay. How about um, the effects of temperature on the virus? Uh, that's, uh, there is a great paper out on humidity issues, um, temperature, uh, wind patterns, airflow. Uh, look, if you can dry this thing out outside, the UV's hitting it, wind's blowing, uh, humidity's up and down, there are definitely a lot more scientific uh, papers. If you go to, um, if you go to Google, so here's what I love doing. Go to Google Scholar, not Google, Google Scholar and type in any topic you want with COVID or SARS coronavirus 2 and then hit the button 2020 publications in 2020 or 2019 and you're going to see peer-reviewed journal articles on almost any topic that you want specific to coronavirus that's a beautiful place to go for information also lancet coronavirus uh, 2019 is a good place all the medical journals are putting out free uh, uh you know any publication that comes out they're putting it on their you know website that you can look at for free as well. Don't go to the news agencies who use this and don't understand what's being said and then try to present it in a way that sells a news story. Go to these places directly and use your eyes and brain to read what the science is saying. You'll be surprised at the difference between how the press is reporting it and how you would read it as a scientist and as a as a individual who who you know can read and determine risk for themselves. Why as a nation are we re reinventing assays for this virus? Well, they, I think it's new. I don't think reinventing is, is the word. I think modifying, um, uh, specifically uh, uh, looking for solutions that are going to be more efficient than the ones we've had in the past. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, with anything novel and anything new, uh, we're, we're, doing the, we're doing the best that we can to modify what currently exists to fit uh, what we're working with today. So I think it's I think that's you're just trying to improve improve on things. We got caught, ladies and gentlemen. I mean that's just the the truth. We got caught, and I, you know a lot of people will say, well, shouldn't we ask for help? That's debatable. Yeah, maybe we should have. Uh, but this uh, this caught us. It caught us off guard, and we're still trying to catch up. How about zinc? Uh, I know we talked about some of the other therapies, medications, treatments. Uh, anything as far as like zinc or other alternative therapies look I'm a, I'm a big believer in vitamin d uh, i'm a big believer in physical activity i'm a big believer in staying hydrated it, it, zinc has proven merit yes linus pauling won a nobel prize for vitamin c i'm a i'm a big believer in all natural aspects as long as you're doing it safely and you're not going grossly overboard on it there's i don't think there's any damage uh, to be done uh, specific to this virus, try and maintain a healthy life uh, uh, phys physically and emotionally and mentally uh, during this time period. Can you explain the mode of entry via nostrils and mouth versus eyes? Uh, well, I think that uh, any mucous membrane, uh, so your nose, uh, the mucous membranes in your nose, mucous lining of your lips, inside your mouth, and even your eyes, they all have ACE2 uh, receptors. And those ACE2 receptors are magnets for the spike proteins of this virus. Um, I think that's why it's so infectious. It's kind of like uh, uh, you're walking when you know when you're when you're working the way that I've seen these healthcare workers work up so close to uh, patients that are suspect or are ill. Um, you're walking through clouds of uh, of spike protein virus that is just looking for ACE2 receptors to attach to. And I think that's uh, that's what's going on. So I guess here's another another one. Uh, how do I take your evidence back to my facility? And I think this is a really important message. How do I take it back to my facility so that we can implement this practice that is so practical? I think that, look, this is a, you know, and I don't mean to get religious in, in any way whatsoever. So please, you know, take my, my point very clear from a religious standpoint. There have been prophets that have walked this earth that have spoken a, a very practical message, and I'm now by no means am I a prophet, but even when the message was perfect, there were people that ignored it, that disregarded it, that fought it, and even killed people uh, for it. And, and so 
I'm not expecting anything better from, from human nature in this regard as well. Um, so I think that there are people that will listen. And I think that based on what we've learned religiously with prophets in the past, focus on those that do choose to listen and dust your sandals off on those that choose not to. Uh, don't waste your time fighting people who think they already know, uh, uh, want to argue with you about it. If you believe in it and, it and it's something that's real for you, find a group of people that agree with you and move. You know, no bonfire was started as a bonfire. It always started with the smallest of sparks. So that's how you sometimes have to start, just piece by piece, spark by spark. I'm hoping that sometime in my lifetime, I'll be able to walk into healthcare and say that the nurses and doctors are getting the protection they need with the threats they face today. I pray for that. Um, that's the truth. Um, right now, it's frustrating to watch what we've watched because for five years, I've been trying to promote that and, uh, and it's been very difficult, so. I, I agree with you. When do you think it's safe to go back to somewhat normal since you said it's not going to go away anytime soon? That's Glory that, from San Diego. Hey, yeah. Glory. Hey, I love San Diego. I was born and raised out there, Grossmont Hospital. Thank you very much. San Diego Woo-hoo. State uh, uh, graduate and uh, even graduated in Fallbrook High School. Uh, my brother did Rancho Bernardo. But anyway, uh, to get to your answer, um, and, and I don't mean to be mean, please don't see me as condescending in any way or rude. But when you say safe, you have to realize that there's so many more risks out there than this. Um, especially if you're not a part of the age group or the pre-existing medical condition aspect, your chances of, of perishing from other things far greater than from this. So um, from a science point of view, the question about when do I think it's safe, I would already argue that for 99% of the world, it's pretty safe. Um, now, that's, that doesn't mean that you're not going to get sick. You may. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be outliers and people that don't fit into the science that get sick and pass away. That has and, and will happen. But that's not out of the ordinary, ladies and gentlemen. That's not, you know, it's not. I think what's changed since the chicken pox parties is our mentality of what safe is. Um, we live with infectious diseases every single day of our lives. Every single day. We live with chronic risks. We live with accidents and environmental risks. So um, the answer to your question is, is that I think unless you're part of a very specific group of people, um, save a safe lifestyle uh, from a from a mental well-being and from an economic well-being and from a societal well-being, I would make an argument that it's still fairly safe in the world you live in today. Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> people may disagree, but bring the science. Bring the science forward. <laughs> I think you you aged yourself, or you telling when you said chicken pox party. Yeah. I believe there's a lot of people in our team here that have no idea what that was. Oh, but. chicken pox. Well, when back in the day, <laughs> you know, I remember because I I was in school and I got invited to my chicken pox party, and uh, my mom said you're not going to school today, and I was like, why? And they said, well, you're going to go play with you know, and I think his name was Anthony. You're going to go play with Anthony. Okay. And when I got over there, Anthony had his shirt off, and I thought, what the heck is this? He had bumps all over him. And my mom said, you're going to wrestle with Anthony. Take your shirt off. And the next thing <laughs> you know, I'm wrestling on the floor with this kid that has pox all over him, and then. I get sick. And then my mom made me do it to my brother. And that, that was what we did. That was yeah, get it over with all was, at the same time in one family. Yeah. And if you did it when they were young, the disease was less severe than if you got it when they were older. And that was what that yeah. was normal. That was normal back then. So. That was so funny. OK, let's talk Motrin versus Tylenol. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. Tough question. Yeah. yeah. That's a, um, I think right now uh, stick with Tylenol. Um, uh, because uh, the, Motrin's getting a bad name. I don't know if it's scientifically merited just yet, but there, there's a lot of people talking about it. And when I say a lot, I'm talking about people that are servicing. That it's not, it's not outside. It's the people that are servicing patients. And so, um, uh, I don't have scientific conclusions on this, but I think what's important is to control fever, especially if it's high. Um, and if Tylenol seems to be doing it, then maybe go with Tylenol. But again, there's no science behind my recommendation, so don't take that very serious. I'm just whispers and rumors through uh, th- through the Motrin aspect. 
Okay, Sean, I'm gonna give you a three question countdown. We got three left. Good deal. Um, I'm ready for a beer. I'm ready, I'm ready. You can have the beer right now. It's That's not gonna should. stop you on that. It's it's <laughs> We started. Uh, yeah, no, this has been great. I mean, the questions keep coming. The engagement's still there. We're really happy for you guys sticking around with us and getting your questions answered. And I'm thanks, happy to serve you guys. I really Absolutely. am. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, so a 58-year-old woman working at for home hospice, mm. taking a biologic for chronic asthma. Should she remain seeing patients in their homes? What a beautiful question. Yeah, beautiful question. You know, you remember the slide that that, that I, I said here, um, and I'm a big hospice guy. I volunteer for hospice, and I miss my hospice patients because right now I'm away. But this question uh, is is really the answer is here. Um, I can't answer that for you. Um, you're going to have to talk to your family. Uh, you're going to have to look at your conditions. You're going to have to make a determination that's best for you. Um, because, and I saw Judy, because when I said, I would argue that the world is a safe place right now for most people, I could see that that really bothered Judy. His, her face was like, oh, and I don't um, know if I'm in the same boat. Yeah, yeah, and that's okay, ladies and gentlemen. That's one thing that we, you know, unfortunately, we have a lot of leaders that believe that disagreement is a, is a, is a, is a premeditator for hate. I don't like that. Uh, everybody's going to disagree. Love them anyway. Uh, people disagree all the time. But I think what's important is, is that Judy has her opinion and I respect her for her opinion. I have mine. She respects me for mine. And, and you're going to have your opinion in this case as well. And I think that that's what's the most important thing is you do what's best for you. Um, considering everything that you have in your life, your conditions, your family, your grandkids, your love, who, whatever you have. And again, that's an assumption. Um, whatever you choose to do, consider what's best for you. So, thank you for that. Uh, one of the follow-ups was um, after actually one of your statements. So, can we go back to stores being open and just wear masks for everyone? He also yeah. said eye protection. So, eyes. Yeah. yeah, I look. I think it's eyes, nose, and mouth. Eyes, nose, and mouth. Eyes, nose, and mouth. Eyes, and I think that's, that's what I want. I, I want to come up with a song. <laughs> eyes, nose, and mouth. Eyes, nose, and mouth. I think that, look, that, I think it's very clear. Baby shark, do, 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 do. I think that's really what, what we've got to do. We've really got to focus on, and again, you're wearing things for two reasons. Number one, when you wear it, you're not able to touch your eyes, nose, and mouth. So that means if you touch a contaminated surface and you're able to touch one of those, you could get sick. But it's also for other people, which means that if you're an asymptomatic carrier, or maybe you don't know you have a fever, you're just tired, um, you're wearing it and anything that could be projected out of your body is not going to be. So, so you're wearing it for two reasons. And I really, again, I truly believe before the end of this month, that recommendation is coming out, so. I agree with you. This yeah. time we agree. Yeah, oh, we agree on a lot. We, we agree that we San Diego is one of the greatest places in the world. We agree on a lot more than we disagree on. <laughs> You are absolutely right. This was a phenomenal presentation oh, and you. taking all the time that you did to answer all the Q&A, we can't thank you enough. I did send out to everybody left on the channel right now or in the presentation, Ava ed at avainfo.org. If we did not get to your question, send us a, a message. We'll put those together. We'll shoot them off to Sean. Sean doesn't seem to sleep and he'll just get them back to us and I'll get them out to everybody. But oh, thank you very much. You're this welcome. has been wonderful. You guys have stuck it out. This has been a long presentation. Um, we still have over 200 of you on. Uh, so thank you. Um, thank you. Safe. Be super safe out there and wear a mask, cover your eyes, nose, and mouth. Thank you guys. Beautiful. Have a good one. Bye bye now. Bye now. Well.